saw you drive um, by my house the other day. Tuesday, April 5th. I saw uh, Riverport, or this, Riverside This is a special ahead. meeting of the uh, Riverside Board of Education, 7 p.m. Uh, Margie, would you, could you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Mr. Brackway? Ms. Kleiber? Here. Ms. Mangia? Here. Mrs. Morello? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. <laughs> Ms. Murphy? Here. Mr. Regan? Here. Is there any uh, public comment? Uh, seeing there's no public comment, uh, the next, the only item of business on the agenda is the resolution for the honorable dismissal of three employees. Um, is there a motion uh, to approve the resolution for honorable dismissals as presented? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? There's no discussion. Um, Margie, can you call the roll, please? Mr. Regan? Aye. Ms. Kleiber? Aye. Ms. Mangia? Aye. Ms. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Morello? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Motion carried. So um, at this point, uh, we will go into the committee of the whole meeting and we'll turn the uh, meeting over to Sherry. Okay, um, tonight we have um, some Hauser highlights. I know Ms. May is here, and I don't know if Meryl, if you have anything else to say in addition? I'm just gonna introduce it. So um, Ms. May from Hauser Junior High, the principal is here and she's gonna present some highlights and we're trying to give our principals a chance to highlight, but this is also timely with respect to the education committee because in her highlights, you're gonna hear some of the work we've been doing to beef up the Encore offerings within Hauser's program, and she's gonna talk a little bit about that tonight, as well as some special programming that deals with the social emotional learning standards. So, April, okay. And I have um, some very special guests that are gonna help me out too. Um, when it gets to their parts because they're really the people doing all the hard work. Um, hopefully. All right. So first, um, the Encore offerings. Where should I be? Maybe the way? you can take the mic down if you want. Or you can pull it out. Do I need to use the mic? It helps. Them it's just for the, for, audio. for the audience on the tape. Yeah. Forget about the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the one that's behind the camera. I'm sorry. That was a really loud one. You can't get it out. <laughs> there you go. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, so for the Encore offerings, um, what students have currently, and, and it's very subtle change for next year, but students have what we call Core and Encore. So Core is your math block, your ELA block, your science and your social studies. So you think about you know those core subjects that we all um, had as well. The Encore um, side of the school is your arts and um, your you know, enhancements, those enrichments that you want students to also be well-rounded. And middle school is about being a well-rounded person and, and developing all of the areas. Um, so for um, middle schoolers, they have three periods a day that they go to Encore. And, um, very similar to what we have this year, um, and I'll highlight maybe the changes as we go through. Every child takes PE, so that is one of their periods, and it's all year long. Um, this year, uh, health came out of PE, and they did it in a, a chunk, a block, kind of to get ourselves caught up. Our uh, proposal for next year is that students will do health in two week spans throughout the school year. So they'll do two weeks and then they're back into PE while another teacher will take their classes for PE for two weeks or for health for two weeks. Um, and so PE is one of those periods. Health comes out of the PE class and our PE classes are looking at the enhanced PE standards. So really looking at um, learning physical fitness and health and making that lifetime goals. Something that you know we all should be doing even as adults. Um, in sixth grade, students have the option, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they also have the option for one of those periods to be band or orchestra. Um, that was uh, instituted uh, for the first time, I, I guess this is the first time this year that those have been in the school day. Those are also year long, but it is an optional choice. So that's something that a child and their parent will make the decision, do I wanna pursue band or orchestra? They can't do both, but they have to do one or the other. Um, in sixth grade, those the only optional thing is band or orchestra. Uh, seventh and eighth graders 
also have the choice of taking a full year foreign language. So we offer Spanish and French. Um, if I am a seventh or an eighth grader and I want to take a full year foreign language and I'm also in band or orchestra and then I also have PE, those are my three. Okay, um, if I am in band or orchestra but I'm not taking a foreign language then I have a choice of other Encore classes. And that's where we're gonna have some additional offerings next year to kind of pull in um, mainly the uh, STEM, STEAM type of classes. So the science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So utilizing all of those um, subject areas and helping kids really be career ready for when they leave college. Um, it's doing that designing and creating using science and math and technology and art and pulling that all together. Our um, hope with that is through our art classes that are offered at all three grade levels, um, our art teacher, Mr. Singh, will be working at incorporating a STEM, STEAM project at each year. So sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, when they take art, will be doing um, a STEAM project. Um, and we've been working, Mr. Smith will be heading that um, along with Merrill and they've been working with Triton College and, and really have some really exciting um, things on the horizon where they will hopefully be able to uh, use a laser or 3D printer to actually have a product at the end that they have designed. So that's one of our additional things. So we're still having art but we're putting a little bit more of that STEAM type project in the art. And then we are adding the STEM class, which we, this year we had computer programming. There will be STEM and computer programming also offered at sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And we can attack the eighth house away. <laughs> right there. Uh, so um, at each grade level, if, I, if I'm not in band or orchestra, and I'm not taking a full year language, then I will end up receiving all six of the offerings of Encore. I know it's a little confusing and when you're not used to doing scheduling, um, you know, it may seem a little, a little confusing. So at sixth grade, they have global cultures, art, communications. So if you wanna think about it, that could be three rotations. So one for each trimester for a period. And then sixth graders also have the STEAM computer programming, music, and speech and drama. Music is another change in the past um, here, or at least this year. Students who weren't in band or orchestra were forced to take a full year of music. Um, usually if a child likes music, they're probably gonna be in band or orchestra. So doing a full year of music, we just figured if we could do music for a trimester, then we could we open up more offerings for students so that they would have other opportunities to learn other things. So the music from this year, which has been a full year, for next year, we're hoping to do just a trimester. So every child will get a trimester of music, but then they're also gonna be able to get into the STEAM classes, the computer programming classes, speech and drama, <coughs> communications, they're gonna be able to get all of those. Same thing will happen at seventh and eighth grade. Um, global cultures goes away and turns into a media communications type thing or a broadcast journalism. So still working with ELA standards really, speaking and listening and reading and researching um, and doing with different media. Um, the STEAM and computer programming classes will be offered at all three grade levels. Um, and the music kind of goes into more of a keyboarding, guitar, a rhythm type drumming, you know, a little more advanced as they move up in seventh and eighth grade. So that a child, if a child isn't in band or orchestra and does not take a foreign language, um, when they're taking their encore classes through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they're not repeating any of the curriculum. They may have art all three years, but they're gonna be doing different projects. So that's kind of a encore <coughs> quick refresher. Two things that I'm just gonna chime in on. One is you'll see a full STEAM STEM proposal for what that will look like at the May COW meeting, we need a whole meeting. Um, Jason Smith and I will be here to talk about that. 
The second thing I wanted to, t to let you know is that since band and orchestra, this was the first year that it was full year in the school day. We're not gonna be changing that for next year, but we are gonna be surveying parents at the end of this year and students to see how they feel about that model. And so then after the second year, we'll have the student parent feedback and we can evaluate whether or not that's something we wanna maintain because it does impact the ability to take more courses throughout the Encore offerings. So we're gonna be getting some feedback on that and see how people have responded to that. Do, we, do you know offhand like what percentage of kids take both of the seventh and eighth graders take both a foreign language and either band or orchestra? I don't know the percentage, but it is um, very common that a child that's in band or orchestra also takes a foreign language. So none of those kids would be able to take any of these electives, Correct. essentially. All right. How, how much of the um, student body, what is it, seventh and eighth grade, take a foreign language? Uh, this year we have, just because I've been working on scheduling, uh, we have four sections of French. Um, no, we have three sec sections of French this year. So we have two sections at seventh grade, one at eighth grade. Um, and for Spanish, we have three, five, ten sections of Spanish. So probably Spanish is very popular. Um, but it's, it's a, probably a very good chunk of students. Would you say? I mean, 50, 60, 70 percent? I'd say probably 65 to 70 percent with those 65 sections. To 70. Yeah. And then you mentioned um, that there's 7th and 8th graders. Right. Seventh and eighth yeah, 7th and 8th graders. Right. Of the 7th and 8th graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders. Sixth graders. The 6th graders, graders don't have foreign, foreign language. language. Yeah. Right. Um, and then for um, the sections, three sections of French, said so two were in the 7th grade and mm -hmm. one section was in the 8th. Is the 8th? Eighth grade, like an advanced, in other words, is it, is it, is yes. it like entry level? So the foreign language, if I can quickly explain, the foreign language basically is a freshman year foreign language level class. So they take the first half their seventh grade year, the second half their eighth grade year, and they actually then test into, when they go to RB, um, many of them test into level two Spanish, level two French. Some even test into level two honors Spanish or honors French. So they're basically taking a freshman level course over the period of two years. They do not get high school credit for it. Um, really what it does is it sets a student up if they're wanting to take a fifth year foreign language that they can get that in their senior year of high school. And then you said they do kind of half of a freshman in the seventh and the other half and eighth. Does mm -hmm. it meet three times a week or? Every it's day. every day. Every day, mm -hmm. all period. year. Mm -hmm. They just take it maybe at a slower pace. It, it's stretched out over two years instead of one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So in this year's freshman class, we had 75 students qualify for honor Spanish, Spanish two at RB. Wow. So they passed out of the first level. And they're doing really well. They mm -hmm. have mostly A's and B's. Mm -hmm. um, now, Again, just a question here. Um, I guess we're talking about French, but um, what is the reason there aren't the same two sections of French in eighth in eighth grade, but there are two in seventh? Well, it's based on student preference. So the students will be here in the next several weeks. Will be getting preference sheets that will be going home to parents, and it will have on there an explanation of each class, Encore class, what it is. Um, for the foreign language, it will explain to students that it is a work intensive class. Um, there's homework, there's tests. Um, it, it takes some extra effort. Um, you're making a year long commitment when you take band or orchestra or a foreign language. So you can't sign up for it and then decide, I don't want to take this anymore because our staffing and everything is done based on those preferences. So from year to year, preferences are different. Also, the class size. Eighth grade is a smaller class it's right much now. Much smaller. Um, yeah, so, so anyway, there was probably only one section of. Uh, there were just that number of French students who signed up for it in seventh, seventh grade. Okay, yes. so that's just. So we're anticipating two sections of French at eighth grade mm -hmm. next year yeah. because we have two at seventh okay. grade. Um, there's and then we more, won't know what we'll have at seventh grade for about a month. There's about 80 more students in the seventh grade than there are in the eighth grade as a class size. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem.
One quick question. So the sixth grade, I know currently, and I only know it because I have a sixth grader, so mm -hmm. the reason, uh, they do global cultures, art, communications, mm -hmm. and they switch trimester. So would would that be the same for one encore, like for one period? One period. Would they still do those mm -hmm. three? Mm -hmm. So if a child does band mm -hmm. and then their other encore is the global cultures, art, communication, they wouldn't have access no. to It will depend the on how we put the schedule together okay. because we're going to have to work it out with staff. But right. there will be six offerings at some point so that the child who's not in band or orchestra doesn't repeat. Right, right, right. Class. That makes it so, so basically three, it will just depend on which their classes trimester. and where yeah. they follow yeah. the schedule. So basically if you are a student who takes band or orchestra, you're kind of um, get three you, you have to choose these, you know, more mm -hmm. STEM, STEAM related mm -hmm. classes or band or orchestra in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Right. You could potentially have band or orchestra and STEAM. Right. And PE. Because what we will do is we'll get preferences from students. Oh, so yeah. instead of in so instead of doing the art communications global cultures, you might right. have okay. that. Right. I get you. Right. Okay, that that preferences. that's nice. We that's nice to, to hear because the seventh and eighth yeah. doesn't. They have that like is really nice language. to hear because I think yeah. for a lot There'll of the band of orchestra students, they're kind they kind of feel like they're stuck. They wouldn't be. Yeah. And not that I don't think. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I thought the global cultures, art, and communication have been great classes mm -hmm. as well. I just there's more of a choice for the rotation. Right. Okay, so that's that's good to hear. That's good. I mean, and of course, everybody's not going to get their preference because that you know. Right. right. We can't We're guarantee try, exactly, but, we'll but you work can try very hard. We'll to try. Get that's great topics. to hear. Over the course of the three trimesters, and that's why we're not doing music year long. It will right. give us more opportunity right. for a kid to get that preference before. That okay, that's great. Okay. That's good to hear. <coughs> Thank you. you. Questions on encore? Okay. I think it's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Just wait until you hear it. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'll wait until May. Wait until May. We have to keep these up to look forward to. Yeah, right. yeah, I won't tell. Yeah, so that, that was just a little trailer for Steve <laughs> that will be coming in May. Um, the next thing we kind of just wanted to share with you, uh, House, the Hauser Way is our PBSS um, system that was actually created last year um, by the teachers and administration together. Uh, district-wide working on the PBSS system. Um, it was created last year, the Hauser Way, act respectfully, be responsible, and choose to be positive. So they, they kind of got that all set with this year's um, really goal is to implement that and make sure that students were aware of that and make sure that we implemented the uh, consequence side, which is hopefully a very tiny portion, and the reward side or the, uh, the data tracking of you know, how kids actually are following this. Um, so we uh, started out the year and um, our phrase that we taught students from the beginning is attack today and they respond the Hauser way. So that's kind of been our motto for the year. Uh, Paw points has been what came out of a uh, teacher, you know, kind of working together this fall on making sure that we were doing positive recognition. So the Paw points are given out to students um, it's an opportunity for us to recognize kids for doing what they're expected to be doing. Uh, instead of focusing on negative behaviors, focusing on the positive. It gives an opportunity for a teacher, an administrator, a secretary to interact with students when they are, when they do see something that they're doing um, that's positive and have that interaction with them, to have a conversation with them, give them, it's a piece of paper, it's brightly colored. Um, and it, it basically has their name on it, and it's a thank you for doing the right thing, either being respectful, being responsible, or positive about things. Um, along with that, um, we've done different monthly rewards um, for students. So when they earn these PAW points, they had the opportunity to put them into different buckets. Some of the um, individual awards that we would draw each month would be um, first in line in the lunch line for a week. Uh, get to sit in the teacher's chair. Uh, we've had an Aunt Diana's gift certificate for $5 each month. Uh, we had a Hauser t-shirt. Um, one of the big ones that kids have been excited to win is to create the music playlist for our passing period. So um, those are some of the individual rewards that kids have gotten as a drawing from putting their paw points in. Uh, we did find that kids 
some kids were really good about turning them in and others it was almost like they didn't really care about turning them in it was I have 25 of them here collected in my pencil pouch and uh, so we've, we've kind of been trying to push them to turn these in um, we use it as a data tracking so making sure the teachers have um, a database that shows each child and how many paw points they've received and so that we can make sure that we are also identifying what kids have not yet been recognized so that we can really focus and find them doing something good and, and help them to feel positive about things. Um, teachers also have the options of using the paw points for classroom rewards, um, grade levels, the teachers at each grade level can do that and then we have offered um, whole school rewards our, our first one was uh, looking at tardies, so trying to get kids to school on time and to reduce those numbers of tardies, especially with the newer schedule. So we did that one first this year because that was kind of, it's hard to get up earlier now. Mm -hmm. um, the next couple that we did, we just looked at numbers of Paul points being turned in. And so kids, uh, they earned a movie and popcorn at the end of one of the um, marking periods. And we are now working on May Madness, where they would have an opportunity to uh, do some kind of fun activities um, at the end of a day coming up in May. Hopefully, they're going to earn that reward. Um, along with that, we also have our social emotional learning standards that have been instituted this year through our advisory class. Our advisory class isn't quite long enough to do a whole lesson. So on Fridays, we have altered schedule and they have an extended advisory where they're going through their SEL lessons. Um, I have the standards there, the goals that we're looking um, to address. Some of the sample lessons are things that, that teachers have done. Grade levels actually do this. They do the planning together. Um, they do goal setting with students. Um, and they have the students set goals and then they go back and have the students think about um, have they reached those goals? Um, in January, we did a boot camp kind of thing to go back and refresh students on what they were supposed to be doing, looking at responsibility, talking about checklists, talking about how do I stay organized, how do I make sure that I'm writing my assignments down. So it's um, a lot of different things like that, as well as team building, um, getting along with others, problem solving, collaborating. So they do different activities on those extended um, Friday advisories so that we can make sure that we're covering our SEL standards. Did I miss anything there, please? Questions? Yeah, I have a question about the, the PAW points. Um, I guess it comes back to this question um, we were talking a little bit about earlier before the meeting with you um, of the difference between sort of intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. So these are kind of, look to me it looks like the PAW points, you're giving extrinsic rewards for good behavior, basically. But it, to me, it seems like at the age these kids are at, in, in middle school, you know, the 12, 13, 14 years old, that they should be getting to the point where the ex intrinsic motivation is the dominant motivation. And it seems, I, I wonder if we're sending, in some ways, the question I have is, are we sending the wrong message, maybe, by giving these rewards and saying, we're kind of paying you to, to behave this way. But really, the message should be, we expect you to behave this way. And, and in fact, this is going to be, There'll be many, many uh, good things that come out of this in your life. The ability to have delayed gratification, the ability to um, you know, be, have to self-discipline, the ability to get along with others. These are all things that you should want for their own sake, not because we're giving awards. So I, I guess I guess I have some questions about the, the program in general. I mean, that's just uh, giving a, a, a rewards like that for behavior that I think is should be expected at that age. That's a great point. Um, middle school is really a transitional time for students when they are moving from things that are extrinsic, including rewards, to intrinsic, um, moving from very concrete learning to abstract learning. Um, you know, I, I understand it's, it's a great point. Um, I would say that the kids here, for the most part, the kids are not focused on the rewards. Um, like I said, some of them aren't even turning them in. <laughs> um, we're wanting them turned in for data tracking so that we can make sure that we're reaching out and finding those kids. We don't want any kids to fall between the cracks. So we want to make sure, you know, is there a child that isn't getting that positive recognition and needs to get that. Um, I can't measure intrinsic motivation, um, but I feel like, or at least I hope, 
that that conversation when a child is, is receiving the paw point begins for them to get that intrinsic feeling that, wow, you know, Mrs. May really, she noticed that, you know, I, I did the right thing, that, you know, I, we've had, you know, kids, I found this $20 bill in the hallway. Oh my gosh, that is awesome, thank you so much. You know, someone's gonna really miss that. You know, let me give you a paw point, that was so responsible of you. Um, you know, just having that quick little conversation, hopefully, will be the beginning of that intrinsic motivation. Um, many of our students, luckily for us, are already intrinsically motivated, um, thanks to good families, uh, for grades and good behavior. Um, but there are also students who still need that extrinsic reward or that recognition or you know, it, it may be that they're not getting recognition. They don't notice it's recognition. Um, and it's also a way to recognize kids um, who do do the right thing. I, I think a lot of times, or I can think in my own schooling, you know, it wasn't the person sitting there doing everything the right way and following the rules that got any type of notice. You know, it was, you know, the person that wasn't following the rules. So it's, it's kind of that, um, you know, and we, we try not to do too much on the reward end, but at the same time, we want them, for those kids that really need something to work for. Mm -hmm. no, I take a point. I that. mean, I just, I just, I just, I guess I, I have questions about, like, the example you gave, if someone turns in some money they found, mm -hmm. and then to give them a paw point, in a way, almost like, I find it almost, uh, the, it's like a payment for doing something that they should feel good about in itself, you know what I'm saying? And they may, maybe yeah. do feel good about doing the right thing. Yeah. So I just, I guess I just have some qualms about that, but it's not yeah. a big deal. I think we're kind of looking at it as like, it's like giving a thank you note. It's like, yeah. hey, thank you. Thank you for doing the right thing. Well, maybe I, you could train me in the paw point program so I can use it in my religious education <laughs> class. <laughs> it sounds like Especially it. if you have any of our kids here, they know all about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I should say that I have yeah. two more not, but, um, but my, mainly they are Hauser kids, mm -hmm. and yes, I could. Mm -hmm. would like to understand your program. Yeah, <laughs> part of it is um, that from that positive behavioral intervention system philosophy of more like the thank you note, and that's why the individual rewards are more chance. They're not automatic. It's more that piece of paper that's the recognition of, you know, a positive affirmation versus a reward per se. So the individual buckets that mm -hmm. she was talking about, you're not guaranteed that. You know, that's, that's a Pretty One slim chance, yeah. slim to not, you so, know, right. based on the amount of a, a quick, reward. Yeah, but it's more questions. that interaction with the positive interaction with the adult is what that system is trying to foster. Which is a good thing yeah. itself. I like the yeah. positive yeah. side of it. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure I like the. I hear what you're saying the, about the, the concrete, the, the concrete paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so as this moves on through the year and progresses, I'm assuming probably different reasons for paw points as you move on. I would, I, you know what I mean? Like, is there a progression or, well, like my my concern is. I'm all for the positive behavior, um, the PBSS. I'm just, my question is, does it lend towards kids playing the game a little bit? Like, trying to get them up. You know, so I'm just curious if in your, if in your experience, does it lend towards them playing the game? Like the kid, know, you know, like, I know I'm gonna get, if I sit here and do my work, I'm gonna get a paw point, and then all of a sudden a kid has 25 paw points. Um, is there a progression of like expectation? Like if you're a kid who always sits there and does your work, you might get it once, but you shouldn't be getting a paw point. So I would, I would love to hear like the actual. Um, Laura, do you want to respond? You look uh, like you I'd want be happy to respond. chime in. I teach eighth grade, okay. And so I will say there's not only a progression from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. There's definitely a progression from sixth grade to eighth grade. Right. You're not going to see the eighth grade teachers giving out those paw points for the same reason that they're yeah. sixth grade. That's sixth grade are just happy that their locker's not jammed, or we're like, right. way to go, right? But my <laughs> grade, the expectation is you can get in and out of your locker. Um, but in my classroom, it's more so like at the beginning of the year, um, when that first student walks in and turns in their homework where I told them to, I'll be like, thank you so much for turning in your homework. And all of a sudden, 24 other kids are like, oh, and they're searching for their homework and they're getting them in. And the one who got it is really just like, and I did it first. You know, it's more of a, and so then, you know, I probably won't give out another plot point for the rest of the year for homework but it could be for the person who comes in and starts doing their bell ringer, and I'll be like, and a paw point for this guy who said, right down to do the bell ringer. And within two seconds, they're all stopped now and they're doing the bell ringer. And it's not so much like, oh, hey, I might win $5 from Aunt Diana's. 
it's more it's almost even just a gentle reminder that um, but instead of pointing out the person who's like why not is your it. homework not right. out yet mm -hmm. it's more so look who's already got their homework in and that's the difference in the philosophy I think and the kids in my opinion respond much more positively to pointing out the one in the room that's doing it right than pointing out the one in the room mm -hmm. who's doing it wrong mm -hmm. Because you don't ever want to be the guy that's doing it wrong. Right. Quite frankly, after a while, it can be kind of funny. You'd be like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, that was me." Yeah, right. But when you point out the one who does a positive, they almost respond um, even more so to be the one that got recognized for, you know, doing what you're supposed to, and not so much because you know they're hoping you know to be the DJ for the week or anything. Especially in the eighth grade, they just assume not. And that, that's <laughs> well, she talked works. about the kids that aren't turning it in. She's talking about the eighth graders. But for that moment when they can go, ah, I got it in first, right? The next day I will actually have a small group of kids that run to the homework bin to see if they can get it in first. So for us, it's just that that reminder of these are the expectations. Thanks for doing them. Keep in mind next year, nobody's handing you a slip, but you need to get this into your habit. You need to get this into your repertoire, and that's what we're helping you to do. And after they get a certain amount of four points, they can turn it in for or like Ant, was that what you said, Ant? Well, no, it's any pop like point can be turned in, but then it just goes into a raffle. Random so you're not drawing. getting something for every ticket. It's a random drawing then that okay. one child out of the almost 600 kids gets an Aunt Diana's gift certificate. Okay. You know, at the end of the month. I'm, I'm curious, um, how, how have you surveyed the staff about just the tracking and how that's working? And has that it, been? I was going to say, that would take a lot of time. I'm the, just curious, as having been in the classroom, like, is it, a, is it a quick thing? Is it something that's, you know? It, it's simple things like what Laura just mentioned. Um, in the beginning, and that's part of the transition, because we were trying to introduce paw points and get the buy-in for both the students and the teachers, a lot of it, at, especially at the beginning of the year, was for very basic things that, no, we are not going to continue to you know, recognize everybody for doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. But in order to get the kids excited about it and to help get the teachers into a habit of it, um, a lot of them just keep them in their little, like there's a plastic pouch that they have their ID in, mm -hmm. and they just keep a few in there. Um, others, what do you guys do? Well, I think to answer, I think the tracking. I, I'm more interested the in the tracking. tracking. Yeah, manageability. We're, we're oh, the office does the tracking. Right. We're very fortunate okay. that the office, you know, teachers are always wishing they had a secretary to help. That's what data. I was thinking about. I and thought, oh, that would take me a while. Really <laughs> <laughs> Smith has done some great okay. data collection this year with other areas, and okay. then we've got some secretaries and admin help doing that. Okay. So it's been yeah, awesome. I just had a question because <laughs> I thought, oh, how would that The work? manageability of it, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I wanted to ask about, um, for the other side of it, for the SEL, um, are you, what, am I right that you would be teaching executive functioning skills and having children kind of filling out their own schedules and that kind of time management? Does that go along with that SEL or is that a different? Sixth, sixth, sixth grade, definitely. Sixth grade. Yeah, I would right. say that's always fit into our advisory. In some years, we right. have more or less time to do it. The advisory right. is so short this year, so that we do a little less of it. But in sixth right. grade, we do a lot of hand holding with filling out assignment notebooks, yeah. studying the calendar, right. time management. So. Right. Yes, and depending on how the advisory is structured, there's definitely So on Fridays, they do a little more SEL in, in that, Correct. and then they, mm -hmm. they change it. OK, thank you. Other questions? Attack the day again. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, we got one day. more. I should have made this one a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, so Cougar Buddies, Ms. Jen Kovar, I'm going to pass the mic, oh, okay. is one of our wonderful uh, sponsors who have taken this over. I'm going to let her share a little bit about that great program. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Jen Kovar. I am fortunate enough to teach sixth grade language arts here at Hauser. Um, and my co-sponsor is Caitlin Stabe and she's a, a special ed teacher um, mostly teaching eighth grade. Um, and so thanks to Pam, we are really excited to be uh, getting Cougar Buddies off the ground this mm -hmm. year. I think you have a little bit of background yes. and so I'm here yeah. to give you more of the, the, the nitty gritty of what we've been doing and a picture of what it looks like now that it's up and running. Um, as you know it's modeled after Best Buddies and mm -hmm. that is very popular at RB and many other middle schools and high schools in the area and but put simply without even thinking about the buddies we've been emphasizing 
organizing an opportunity for kids of all shapes and sizes to come together in a social environment. So when I talk to the kids about it, in a lot of ways, you know, they ask, what are, what's it about? What are we gonna do? It's a social club. It's a place to come together. We do a range of activities. Um, but then we, we have talked from the beginning about the underlying mission. There's a number of, of underlying missions. Um, one is to push back against the segregation that uh, students with disabilities of various mm -hmm. sorts um, have always faced. And anyone in society that has a disability has faced that segregation from the general population. And so we have been overt in a, in a subtle way, overt but subtly, talking to the, the Hauser population about that mission, that we um, often aren't comfortable with our peers that have some sort of disability, whether it's cognitive or physical. And so this is a chance to get to know someone, um, reach out to them, and then in turn, um, your your regular students are, are um, gaining a lot. So it, it goes both ways, that obviously we want to help students students who might struggle with making friends for various reasons, we're helping them to make a bridge, but then on the flip side, you'll hear again and again that students who um, are, I don't always have the right words for it, but your, your average typical, typical student, peer. your typical peer, um, ends up gaining just as much if not more from that, that new friendship and that understanding of students with various disabilities. So with that said, we bring the kids together for lots of different activities. One week we went to a Hauser basketball game and we made signs and we were just there to cheer the team on. It's just a, a social outing. Um, another week we'll be making some sort of arts, arts or craft activity. One of the moms is um, being extra helpful and offering <laughs> to bring in some supplies, which is so appreciative. Mm -hmm. uh, we are so appreciative. Um, we're also doing, so we have those types of activities, but we're also taking on a number of community service um, activities. We are helping with the canned food drive um, starting tomorrow morning. We've got a group of kids signed up to come in and help collect the cans and just be part of that larger mission. So we have two or three community service type activities going on as well. And as this is our first year, it's all new and we're keeping it simple and starting small and there's a ton of potential. Um, we've met with folks at RB and also at Brooks Middle School in Oak Park to get lots of inspiration and ideas for the, the possibilities of this club. So it's exciting. It's in its early stages and really it's just it's fun. It's, it's, a, it's a cool club. Thank yeah, you. We had a math that. meeting over here one day when they were in here, and it was like so much fun to hear all the kids. They were so excited, and all the elementary teachers were saying, "What's going on in there?" <laughs> <laughs> they explained it all, but um, it was pretty neat to hear. Well, them. thank you for everything that you're doing, and also thank you to Pam for tailoring it for I us. Just one thing: can you share a little bit about the um, end? I spread the word to end the ah. word, and about how it's. <laughs> Sure. So one of the other uh, initiatives we're moving forward on right now, there's a national campaign called Spread the Word to End the Word, and mm -hmm. it's focused mm -hmm. around eradicating the word retard in schools. And um, you, you, once you hear it once, you'll notice mm -hmm. it out in the community. Um, and so the students are helping to put together this campaign that we're, gonna, we're going to put into place at Hauser the last week of April mm -hmm. will be... Uh, We'll have these huge banners in the cafeteria and we'll be asking students to take a pledge. The The heart of it is this taking a pledge to not use the R word. We'll be writing, um, and the kids The kids are writing announcements to be read over the loudspeaker. We'll be going to advisories to make announcements, posters. Um, and it's up, it's student, the idea is that it's student driven. This year we don't have an official executive committee like you would with a student council, mm -hmm. um, but next year we'll tap some of our leaders and have them drive the activities even more. Mm -hmm. Did that hit what you yeah. were hoping I think for? You had shared with me too that it was a student who suggested. The um, yeah, so I, th I want to say that we had the idea from RB because it's this national campaign, but then once we, we do a lot of brainstorming with the kids, and so once we start, we must have hit on a video or something about this activity, and then the, the kids, like, yeah, we want to do this at Hauser, and the, it snowballed from there, and we do really want them to take ownership of it. I had a student write the email that I then sent to April and Jason okay. to explain what it was all about and, uh, and help get it. 
And one other really sweet little anecdote, um, this is one small example of many types of behaviors, but um, students of all sorts come to Cougar Buddies, not only disabled students, but we've encouraged a lot of socially awkward students, students that have trouble making friends to begin with. Um, and one day a boy came for the first time. And it's also neat that it's a really open club. You can come this week and not show up next week. You can join months later. So one little boy came for the first time and sat by himself. And this was what you'd call a typically abled peer. And um, I, I, I left him alone. I thought later we'll regroup him. You know, we're supposed to be working in groups. You're supposed to be interacting with your peers. Well, lo and behold, one of our cognitive disabled students noticed and took it upon himself to move over and sat with the, the, oh, the loner boy without anybody making that suggestion. So it was just really sweet, Very you know, happy. one of those tug at your heartstrings mm -hmm. moments. So, so it's really important. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks yeah. for all your hard work. One question me. before we move on. Um, the membership, I, it, this being the first year of the project, has the membership met expectations or can you talk about that a little bit? I don't know if Pam did information about that. Yeah, our numbers are up there. <clears throat> Pam, did you right. have a prediction of how yeah. how many you know, you... I think it's hard to say with these types of, of programs. You know, I, I would have been happy with a dozen students yeah. um, for the size of the school. I think due to the fact that in December when we had the informational meeting, there were 49 students, and you look at how many, 36 of those 49 are part of the program, I think that's that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and we expect it to snowball as yeah. the kids talk about it. That's what we've heard at RB, that it, it will really grow in popularity right. as you know somebody's friend joins and then they say, oh, I need to join Cougar Buddies too. So we do expect the numbers to keep growing. Mm -hmm. that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any questions on that? Did we miss a page? The spark? And it's coming. Okay. We should reverse the order. Oh, okay. okay, we have a different order. <laughs> oh, okay. And the packet is reversed. <laughs> so we have Laura Mandrella here, and she is one of our eighth grade ELA teachers. Um, and I know, actually, I was I was sharing yeah, with was you. Yeah, I was so excited to hear about this. Um, yeah. She was telling me about it, and and then some of the she's going to share some of the great ideas that kids were sharing. Um, but it's it's a small part of a larger uh, motion that the eighth grade ELA teachers take on that then encompasses looking at a charity and doing some service type work and you know really trying to make a difference as eighth graders and, and the eighth grade teachers as a whole do a great job of really preparing kids to be productive citizens. So I'm going to let her <laughs> talk a little bit about that. You got it. Um, again, my name is Laura Mandrella. I teach eighth grade ELA. I know I've had some of you, <coughs> some of your students in the past um, and our will soon in the future. Um, so all year long our number one goal in eighth grade is to make sure that we transition these students to high school so that they are successful from day one. Um, that's our primary goal for all three trimesters. But trimester three we take on a little bit of a different focus and that is preparing them for the and beyond. And so we are not just focused so much on the academics, although clearly that's a part of it, but making sure that they are top quality citizens um, and beyond. And so. One of the things that we do is we tell them that trimester three is not only about making you a high school student, um, but a global uh, society member. And um, we tell them that our number one priority for trimester three is to teach them to quit looking in the mirror and start looking out the window. That's our goal for trimester three. And they get it pretty quickly. So our first unit is um, all based on um, philanthropy. And so um, we have a number of reading standards clearly with the curriculum that we need to cover and so we do a lot of reading about um, philanthropists and at first it seems very obvious to go with a, a Bill Gates or somebody well known but in order to truly reach them we have them read about um, philanthropists who are 17 or younger and the difference that they've made and so their job is to research children philanthropists and get back to us and tell us what they've done so that I can say to them all right well if this eighth grader can or if this eight-year-old can have a lemonade stand and rate five thousand dollars what can you do for the world and then they start to think like oh you're right and so based off of that idea what one of the people that I introduced them to, who was just a little bit older, was a student at the University of Illinois Chicago who went downtown one day and realized that all the homeless people were asking for food. And so he had taken his sandwich out of his lunch and handed it to a homeless person and received such an amazing response that he went back to UIC and said to a couple of his frat buddies, you know, I felt really good over a sandwich. I mean, this is crazy that people would be that 
um, you know, outspoken about a sandwich. And so a couple of his buddies thought, you know what? We're in college, but we can afford three dollars for some bread and some peanut butter. Let's make some sandwiches this weekend and let's go downtown and see how many people we can feed. And that's what they did. You know, college students, very limited money, and you know, very little effort to make a huge impact. Then they went back to UIC and the word started to spread and next thing you know they had a major pizza company that was giving them all the leftover pizzas at the end of the night. They had organizations from all over the college who were chipping in, all because one guy decided to give somebody a sandwich. So this is the example that I give to them. And so um, I kind of uh, pair that up with the movie Pay It Forward, where mm -hmm. in the very beginning, um, Kevin Spacey says to his kids, you only have one homework assignment for this year, change the world and make it a better place. And so on that particular day they come in and the homework board just says, go change the world. And so that's the only direction they're given. Um, and then they're told to just go off and decide what that means. Only we say, you know, change your house or world. Make this a community <laughs> that people want to be a part of. And so, um, you know, the first year I did it was just last year. And um, I just tried it with one class just to see how it would go. You know, there's that little element of chaos in the eighth grade that you're a little afraid of. <laughs> and so, you know, you don't want to let them go too quickly without knowing what they're going to create. Um, and they took my breath away. I mean, I was absolutely astounded at what these kids came up with. Mm -hmm. And so this year I thought, well, let's try it on a little bit bigger scale. And um, took it to uh, three of my classes and basically just said, make Hauser the kind of place that people are excited to come to every day and um, you know the part of the Hauser community and what they came back with again um, just absolutely blew my mind um, we had kids that um, uh, two boys that went to the gender and said you know what we're pigs we admit it we apologize <laughs> but we want to help and so they came in after school and they paired up with one of the janitors and they started doing work and one of the boys had to go play a volleyball game. And the other one was like, there's too much work here, I can't leave. So he stayed. And the other one went and played the volleyball game. When the volleyball game was over at six o'clock at night, he changed back into his clothes and went back. Because they're like, this is a huge job, Mrs. Mandrella. And I'm like, well, thanks to you, it wasn't as big of a job today. And that the janitors could not thank us enough. I mean, they just thought yeah. what incredibly thoughtful young men they were. Um, we had kids who made sticky notes and put them on every single locker with just and every single locker in the school said something like be proud of yourself because someone here is proud of you or you know smile because you just might make someone's day every single locker in the entire school was covered and uh, those kids were here early and they were you know st sticking them on there and I had kids that were like oh look at this my you know my sticky note says I could win the Hunger Games you know? <laughs> and that made their day and that was the whole point and so that week each and every day somebody showed up like what's going to happen here today what awesome things are going to happen here today mm -hmm. and it wasn't just the students and the custodians it was the secretaries it was the teachers um, they even you know we had one um, two young men that said you know the Hauser community for us isn't just the students and the teachers here but it's the parents too and we have a parent that lets us as a group of eighth graders come over like every Friday night and I said well God bless her <laughs> said, exactly. so what we'd really like to do because we have never actually said it to her is we'd like to say thank you mm -hmm. and I said you know I think she'd really appreciate that mm -hmm. and out there right now there is a mom who actually was thanked by an yep. entire group of eighth graders <laughs> for letting them come over and have a safe yeah, place to make good choices on a Friday night and they showed up with flowers and chocolate for oh. her and um, I'm sure so made cute. her day and so, so um, in the process made their own and so um, it's just it's probably one of the most rewarding things that we do during the year um, you know like I said right now it's just my three classes because um, you know that was 72 kids running around doing these things mm -hmm. I think opening it up to like 210 kids could just be you know mass chaos here in the eighth grade <laughs> people running to do things um, but it really gave them the idea and um, this was the first year that I actually got to receive a spark this year. I came in and um, had received something on my desk, and there was a thing full of tulips, and there was just a note that says, we get it now. Oh. And that's all it said. And I'm like, all right, my job is done. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a beautiful introduction to our philanthropy unit. Um, about five years ago, um, the PTA was responsible for the eighth grade class gift, and they provided us with a number of wonderful things. We've had all kinds of, uh, you know, trees planted in their honor and portraits in the hallway, but they had a hard time getting the eighth graders invested in the yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. So they um, asked for the help of the student council to help them to be able to raise some funds and be able to come up with some new ideas. Um, and then about four years ago, when we were starting to revamp our curriculum, um, and I became involved in the student council, I said, let's kill two birds with one stone here let's have the eighth graders decide 
what they want their class gift to be. And we came up with the idea of the charity paper. Um, every single eighth grader um, picks a charity that is near and dear to them for whatever reason. Um, some of them have personal connections, some of them have personal interests, and some of them um, just choose one based on you know one that they've heard quite a bit. And they will do a significant amount of research and write a persuasive paper to their own peers mm -hmm. as to why they should adopt that charity for the eighth grade class gift. Mm -hmm. um, then each and every class will read That's all of awesome. the entries from their class and they will pick um, the best ones. And so then we will have one winner from each class. This year we have seven sections of eighth grade ELA. So then we put um, all seven essays onto a Google form and everybody got to read them. So this is authentic writing for a real audience for a real purpose. And in the end, um, they chose one charity um, that will represent this eighth grade class. Um, and uh, we will announce to them this Friday who the winner is and kind of have a kickoff meeting. So um, they vote on it, they all vote. They all vote, every single one voted on it, correct. Every, in their advisory, they all had a chance to read every single essay and decide which one made the most sense for them as an eighth grade class. Mm -hmm. um, it has worked out beautifully in the past because um, now they have the investment factor and they know why they chose that charity and they know who it was important to and why they wrote it. And um, so last year, uh, well, a, a few years back, we were able to do um, the ALS Foundation um, mm -hmm. for uh, a young man who uh, had a personal connection with that. Um, the year after that, we had the Make-A-Wish Foundation mm -hmm. uh, for an eighth grader who had actually received a wish that was part of our graduating mm -hmm. class. Um, last year, we, were, uh, we represented the Angelman Syndrome Foundation um, as we had an eighth grader who had uh, a, sibling, a sibling that was a part of that organization. Um, and we've had tremendous results. Um, we averaged between $3,000 and $4,000 that wow. um, the wow. eighth graders themselves will raise. Wow, that's amazing. Um, is this, this handled as an assignment in the English language arts? It is, uh, the actual charity paper itself in the voting is, and then after we have chosen the charity, we have our kickoff meeting, um, the student council will help brainstorm ideas to raise the money, as will the eighth graders. And so, for example, I know we had a group of eighth graders that already went out at Christmas time and sang Christmas carols for money, and so they're dying to find out what the charity's gonna yeah. be because they've already raised you know, like $200 that they want to donate to it. Um, some kids will individually do things like hold a car wash or, you know, mow lawns on a neighbor's street or what have you, but because it's their choice and their vote for their charity, mm -hmm. um, they become really invested in it, and we also have a lot of fun fundraising. The things they come up with <laughs> are just too much fun. And so, um, and teachers are always willing to help too. As a matter of fact, the teachers have already raised $300 this week. We wow. paid $10 to get to wear jeans and not have to worry about our clothes <laughs> on the first week back. <laughs> so we've already got $300 just from the teachers to be able to, uh, to give to the charity as well. Oh, awesome. um, and so um, that's what we're looking forward to going towards the end of the year and keep reminding them that this is, this is their cause, this is mm -hmm. their choice, um, and uh, this is what they will be remembered for. Mm -hmm. um, and just like when we started out with the SPARK program, um, not that their name is ever attached to it, just that uh, mm -hmm. the effect that they created is attached and that someone in the world will be better off because of them. So. And there's your intrinsic motivation. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. That's, I was really excited. Yeah. So thank yeah. you nice so bench. much. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Yeah, exactly. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for letting us share. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was talking with Meryl. I, I especially um, think it's important that we get to hear from all the principals, and that's a goal for us on the Education Committee, and I'm excited to hear on a regular basis what everyone's doing, because obviously we're not there every day, and um, so I think it's really cool to hear what they're doing. So thank stuff you for like coming late. Stuff you don't hear about, yeah. you know, when I'm sitting right. talking about curriculum adoption, you don't get to hear all the cool things the students are right. doing. Oh, yeah. so it, is, it is really yeah. a good opportunity. Great. Everybody. And so I think that concludes our education committee. So we can pass it on. All I can say is wow. Yeah, I know. So it's a cool place to be. Thanks, I guys. Go <laughs> we just went from like you basically made me cry. Oh. Now people are gonna cry, <laughs> cry out of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the policy committee. Don't meeting. feel like we have to say we totally get it. Yeah. No, but I, I do. Just to echo to Sherry's that. sentiment, it's great to hear from Hauser because I think parent engagement goes down as the kids get older and so you never really hear what's going on at the middle school so it's it was great to hear what you so do thank today you. nothing yeah exactly thank you go put on some jeans and relax <laughs> although you know how much do they pay you could have upped the ante a little bit and you know and raised even more money i said for a hundred dollars i do it for the rest of the year you know? <laughs> oh well, there you go anything then i have to get up and great job somewhere. super <laughs> thank, you. thank you both Thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving on, policy committee. Um, so.
So the I, I want to take this a little separately because uh, it looks like everything is under the IASB press update 91, which we have, but there are two policies underneath here that are not part of the press update, but from um, uh, the wellness committee and a board member. So I want to, I want to, if, if, if it's okay with you guys pull out number one and number three and talk about those separately, then the rest, which are all a part of the press update 91. Is that good with everybody? Yeah. Okay. So starting with, um, the, uh, so these are first reading of all of these policies. Starting with policy two colon one one zero, qualifications, terms, and duties of board officers. Um, from what I understand, Mary Rose brought this up to um, I somebody. A, so if I you want to go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, I sent a link around. Um, we are, um, our board policy uh, states that our board secretary is a non-board member, and that's certainly the way it's been since I've been uh, on the board. We actually, every two years, would reappoint either Sue Moorhead and then Juanita. And that is, and so I just brought to the attention because we did take Griff's recommendation to appoint uh, Linda a few months earlier. So we're actually out of compliance with our policy. So um, I noticed that uh, the change uh, that you made is just to say that it, you know, just added a line to. Uh, th this comes straight from Griff because I nobody right. told me about this policy until yesterday. Uh, okay. so, so this came straight from Griff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so they added the line, and so this morning, um, you know, I decided just to do a little googling around to see what other districts are doing. I noticed that River Four. Uh, first of all. Uh, those that uh, have board secretaries, it's an elect. It's considered an officer elected position. Um, again, I didn't look at hundreds of them, but um, but the, um, um, I also looked at our, and I believe River Forest has it as a, a board position. Um, RB has the identical policy to ours, yep. which is a non-board right. position. And I went and I looked at Western Springs because every once in a while you go around and you look at other board meeting minutes and different things to see if you can learn something. And I noticed that uh, actually the superintendent over at Western Springs um, actually does the minutes and signs them and does that. So I, out of curiosity, went and looked at theirs. And their board elects their board secretary and their board, and they elect the superintendent. They basically said it is the duties of the superintendent to be the board secretary. Also, um, so I was kind of wondering where this language came from, and I don't mean the, you know, the change we made, the one that we've had historically, the one that has RB and the one that River Forest has, um, you know, because I suspect they both have come from the IASB. Yeah. At one point, people have this option. Um, and then I also, in the hopes to look at that, I googled the IASB website. This was a couple weeks ago when I came across this thing. And uh, what they point out is that, um, that it, there's actually a fair amount of staff work to the board secretary position. It's, it's more than you know just signing documents and uh, there are other duties involved with it. And, and so, um, so anyway, so they, uh, even if you have a secretary, a, a board member who is a secretary as an officer, there should be somebody and staff who does a lot of those duties because it requires a regular presence in the office. So, um, so, right? so anyway, that's the background. That's the work that I've done on this. Um, and here, here's my preference. Uh, um, my my recommendation is that we have a vote to override our policy. Uh, and keep Linda in the position until April. And then maybe when Martha comes on board, she can kind of look at the pros and cons and maybe research just a little bit more and, and you know, make a recommendation uh, to, to the board. Because I don't, I don't get the sense this has been well researched as to you know, why people do things. The only other thing that I do have a very specific question on is one of the duties of the board secretary apparently is handling some election duties. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, the board president used to have a lot of election, have some election duties. For example, challenging positions, petitions, and those were changed about two years ago when the legislature. Uh, those are removed from the board president. Um, 
because there's some recognition that board board member positions are increasingly more political than they used to be. So uh, I would like to know before I um, ha is our current policy up to date on what the board secretary's election duties are because I thought all of them were supposedly removed, but I'm not sure. Our pa policy. Pat, um, I know this was Pro Griff's recommendation. Had you talked with him about the initial well, suggestion? I, Do you have any experience? Yeah, after Mary Rose uh, called yeah. this morning, I called IASB. Uh, Anna Laverne is the person who basically puts together the press uh, booklet in the whole business, and she's kind of the person that ties together all of the information from the various law firms and comes up with recommendations. Uh, very honestly, I asked her, you know, what are the pros and the cons of two different approaches? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't throw the superintendent one in there because I'd have to decline that one. I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to write the like minutes. That but school districts either have a board member that's the board secretary, or they have someone else that's appointed the board secretary. Mm -hmm. And this lady really said it's kind of an historical thing, going back that a lot of districts have done it a certain way for a, a long period of time. But the one thing that she said, which I think is a key, which is really what we're accomplishing the way we're doing it, is she talked about best practice. Mm -hmm. That if you have a board member who's also the board secretary and there is no one else, that board member then can't really get actively involved in any of the, in discussion, the discussion because right. they're so busy taking down who made the motion, who seconded it, the whole business. The fact that we have Margie sitting at the table mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who's able to do the you know that part of it the the written form okay. and Linda still can function as a board member sharing mm -hmm. thoughts on different topics is kind of the best practice or the ideal situation yeah, and agree. so that that really is what came out of the okay. uh, conversation with okay. ISB okay. yeah I, I know Griff made the recommendation but um, but I also know that he didn't point out to us that we actually had a policy that governed it so I you know I think again it might have been just a historical thing like you said what people are used to you know, looking at this policy, it seems though that under the original language, we're actually in compliance because the secretary, they're talking about the secretary, all, you, Linda, you don't do all of those functions. No. no. And no. they say basically the, te the secretary can, can delegate, delegate everything, everything to somebody right, else. Yeah, and it says interchangeably that um, even if we uh, appoint a non board member, the secretary for the would be board member can act when that person can't act. It, so it seems like it, it's it's not the best language, but it. Well, I think it's fine the way it is because it's it's used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Well, again, do we want to do an election, or do we want an appointment? Does anybody care one way or the other? No, I'm I, I'm happy if Margie's here doing all those. Thank you, Margie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Duties. Yeah. Yeah. I just, from what I remember, there, Rachel, though, are, you're not saying that. The original language is is consistent with what we're doing. I don't think it is. Is it? Because it says that the the original language says the secretary shall be a non-board member who mm -hmm. serves as the board. So that that clearly was we're sort of violating that. But then it goes on to say at the end that you, um, we can delegate. They can delegate it. So mm -hmm. so with Griff's change to to say that it uh, it may be a board member. But the last sentence says the board appoints a secretary pro tempore. I don't speak Latin. <laughs> who may or may not be a board member if the secretary is absent from any meeting or refuses to perform the duties of the office. So that's essentially what function Linda is serving is when Margie's not here or she acts like. So the main the main second. thing that I do. Right. So the main thing that I do and the reason Griff recommended it is that Margie's not signing away on every like Margie's signature is not the one on all our documents. Um, I don't know if there's a legal reason behind that or a liability reason well, behind Margie it. Margie will be sued. You don't have to worry. Exactly. So, <laughs> so from Griff's recommendation was that a board member be the board secretary for that function. For the sole purpose of citing documents. Because you're not recording the minute that, that Margie's when, when he recommended it, that is what he right. described. And so my sole function has been signing the documents as a board secretary, reviewing everything that Margie prepares mm -hmm. carefully, signing them so that it's my name on there, and then also when we are in when Margie's not around, I mm -hmm. call roll. <laughs> so literally, <laughs> my duties as board secretary are very minimal, and I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other on this. I think we just took risk recommendations. Well, I think so there I, is an argument to be made to have another, another independent, even though Margie is actually writing the minutes, for example, it, it, it is maybe a good idea to have another set of independent eyes mm -hmm. to actually read them carefully. Because I know that I'm, I'm going to be signing so these I minutes, to, so I make sure I read them pretty carefully. the same way. It's like, you know, it's that's, like, well, okay, I that's the only thing that I think it adds. Well, um, 
No, that you make a valid point. Then maybe we should just amend that policy altogether to ensure that your role is limited to because it sounds they're all lumped together mm -hmm. as all these duties yeah, are performed right. by one person to se segregate it out and say we're going to have a board member that that is the secretary and signs off on things and the other board secretary does X these things. Right. Is there, any, that, is there I, I, other, any other reason, though, just to look at some of the official uh, IASB version of the language when you have a board member? Because there is. There's a whole different, um, of course, they, they do say it's an election. You know, they call it an officer when well, it's a board member. Right. And it's got a term length. So basically, the meeting when we elect the vice president and the president, uh, from what I, in the brief time I had to look at this, the, the, all the policies I looked at had a term You could elect a secretary. Yeah, you basically the same night after, you know, our first yeah, meeting. Right. It's part of the reorganization. Right. right. And right. we used to, again, that would be the, I think the next meeting we would appoint yeah. Sue and, or Juanita, whoever actually served that function every two mm -hmm. years. I'm familiar with the title <coughs> board clerk for oh. the person in, in Margie's role. Mm -hmm. it, there might be a reason to research you know, how many school districts actually call the person who's a district office employee mm -hmm. the board clerk? Um, well, you make a good point. If you're going to have a board secretary, mm -hmm. um, then it, it, um, a, a, as a board member, then it might be a change of title on and the internal staff that supports that role. There are legal documents that ask for the signature of a board secretary. Mm -hmm. Right. We right. know that we recognize I've that. I've signed a million right. of them. And yes. that being an elected official rather than a district okay. office employee right. right. is, is, is a best practice I because you have Juanita and Sue Moorhead going, whoa, 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 yeah, you're, you're, you're asking me to yeah. take a vote that I'm not them. comfortable yeah. with. <laughs> right. But so the elected right. official is the board secretary. The board clerk is someone who's mm -hmm. doing all of the legwork and, mm -hmm. and publishing the minutes for approval mm -hmm. by the board secretary. And, and Rachel, to backtrack, couldn't it be simply saying that the board secretary may be a board member? Isn't it, it, wouldn't that be a simple enough change in the policy? Well, I think, I, that's I think about we should say the done. secretary, it sounds like, should be the board member. I like the idea of, of just making a distinction of here's the clerk, here's the, the, the board's duties, and here's the secretary, because it's the, it is a legal term of art. Yeah. And if we want to make election out of it, that's fine. I don't have an issue with it. Yeah. So it looks like maybe what we should do, it, t tell me if I'm wrong here, it sounds like a consensus of that we still want to have a, an elected board member Sign. fill the role of board secretary in terms of signatures, right. um, but that obviously <laughs> I don't want Margie's job. <laughs> I mean, I'm careful. glad to have you. This could be a coup. So that yeah. maybe we, I should look into pol like looking at policies that distinguishes the two, and that, um, if possible, I think might it would be easiest just to do another reorganizational meeting. It's a two-year term. Yes. With well, president, vice president, yes. and secretary. Yeah, and I mean, in the meantime, we could always just you know vote to override our policy and c continue on the way we are I, with you in it. Yeah, I'm. Whatever I'm, keeps yeah. us. I'm good. So, so I'm assuming then at the next <coughs> policy meeting, I can bring a first reading of a, a different, cha you know, recommend sure. recommendation. It's just a matter of language, really. For yeah, me. it's just a matter of language. Yeah. It, yeah. If we're all on the same if page, we're which on it the sounds same page. Like Actually, you, if you do tweak yeah. it, you can bring it back for the second oh. reading if it's acceptable. Okay. You don't have to go right. through a first right, reading right. again. Okay, that's, yeah. um, that's as, as long as we're on the topic of this particular policy we, we don't um, it also mentions that we have a, a treasurer which we don't have actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so maybe we should get rid of that Just language straight, yeah. unless we unless I, we decide to have a treasurer I, I believe I believe what <laughs> happens is that our treasurer is actually um, proviso and the township the treasurer yeah. office oh, yeah. and I think okay. somewhere again I looked at a few policies yeah. today somewhere at the bottom it actually says that the board if you have a township treasurer system they are your treasurer, and there's some okay. language in there. Maybe at the very bottom of that one, or some other one I read. So the language is weird because this is the board. Of, the board of education officers are president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. So it sounds it makes it, it sound like, like it's actually like a person. Yeah. That's I've, sitting and I think some boards do have treasurers. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know, it, those, if we want to tailor it to of, our specific we just outside, outside of Cook County, County. Right. Yeah. Those outside of Cook County. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so. maybe we should eliminate it altogether because it's. David, yeah. is that your experience? Every school district should have an investment policy, and within the investment policy, you'll see all kinds of references to school treasurer. And in Cook County, that school treasurer is the township school township. treasurer. Unless they've done away with in the position. Case, yeah, in unless they've the done away with right. 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 Um, Last year, the uh, investment policy changed, and, um, uh, you know, the policy, and we actually went and made sure that 
the township treasurer was actually yeah. adopting. Remember? Yeah, right. yeah I remember us right, making right. revisions. In the, that they were actually going to be in compliance with the law on that particular. Right. Um, and and so certainly the proviso township treasurer will not let us forget that they have that legal authority and, and that legal role with this school district. Yeah, it, it didn't yeah, do those any. Are the, those are the geniuses that invested uh, our <laughs> yeah. time at, is that right? <laughs> yes. 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 They're trying to go from like getting uh, five basis points to 20 basis points. That's or right. Or hopefully pick up. Right. Yeah. Investing in hotels in Florida. That's great. <laughs> great. Yeah, or, or sign me yeah. up. Somebody or else would be the treasurer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should we make that an elected? <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, David, do you think we should alter it and remove treasurer, or keep or that? Leave it, assuming that it's understood its proviso, yeah. or look at what other Cook County, you know, is look it, at other policies, see what they're. Yeah, it, I don't know. I think having the, a footnote to explain that the treasurer is the proviso okay. school treasurer uh, is is probably sufficient. Yeah, and that is what I saw. I don't remember which school I was looking at, but that's what but I. But I've only looked at three, law. so it had to be in one of them. And um, and I think all three of them were in Cook County, right? Western Springs, River Forest, and uh, yeah, okay. and Western Springs. Western Springs doesn't look like they use press, by the way. They look like they do something else. <laughs> Got a whole different numbering system. Yeah, they use push instead of press. <laughs> what? Did you make that up? He, he, did, make he did make okay. that up. <laughs> so, so we're in consensus on that. We can move forward to the next one. Right. Yes. Okay. So I want to. And again, skip. you can bring it back after it's tweaked okay. for a yes. second reading. Yes. So we will bring that back to you for a second reading with the changes. Okay. Um, moving on, I'm going to skip over two really quickly and move to number three, policy six colon five zero school wellness. Just to give a little bit of background, last. Was it at the regular board meeting or the last committee of the whole? No, last regular board meeting, we had a presentation by the wellness committee, um, uh, Dr. Shaw, and they meant they reviewed, do, because our policy states that we're supposed to re have a, create a wellness committee and review our policy mm -hmm. and procedures, they did that. So what they did is they brought some ch recommended changes to the policy, um, the current policy that's already, that we already have. Um, and just to make note, that policy is required by law. We have to have a wellness policy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a public act and a, I can't remember the name of the, the law. Nobody <laughs> you can. Know. We just look at the footnote. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so, hold on, I just got booted off of this. And annually, a committee needs to be called to review it. Right, and yeah. so we, we stated that <laughs> this year. Um, so. The policy 6 colon 50 has been been there since 2010 when it was adopted and the recommendations of the committee are just to add two changes. The first change is under the goals for nutritional education. Um, it's Our policy currently says nutrition education shall be integrated into various curriculum lessons and then they're just adding with some emphasis on impact of food allergies. And then they added um, an, an additional section for goals for social emotional learning. So those were the two, there's a whole section on that. Um, those are the two recommended changes they are mentioning, mm -hmm. correct? And most of that, uh, Pam, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was drafted uh, partially by you and one of the social right. workers? Right. right, so the language was drafted by administration. In Is this? reviewing it, the first thing that I noticed, and it was funny because Carrie came to the same conclusion when she read it, as much as we look at wellness and at board meetings, we've talked about social emotional it's not in learning the policy. And, and, and there the are whole child, if there was nothing in, the in this that right. dealt with that mm -hmm. important social emotional piece, mm -hmm. because if children aren't social, social emotionally well and available That's to right. learn, then you're not going to have learning. So That's right. we thought that it was important to add that and we are just doing something so many other things. There's also new social emotional learning standards that right. were right. adopted back then and right. should be acknowledged. So just a few other things I, I noticed in the in the policy. Um, since we're adding that section under the mission, we would have to add, there's a whole list of each goal we're going to go through, so we would have to add the and social emotional learning goal. And mm -hmm. then there's a few, oh, right. mm -hmm. yeah, so that's one thing I noted. And there's a few um, parts in the policy, and I never got around to doing this today, which I meant to, is that it, um, 
directs you to the handbook for a certain page on the handbook. Oh, and I just was wondering if that actually is up to date since we updated the, the handbook. The pages are probably not up to date. You're okay, so I can go ahead are. and look. Oh, are they? Did you go and go I did. Oh, oh my God, goodness, girl. Margie. Oh, thank you. Well, well, you delegated that. that yes. duty. I delegated the duty <laughs> to Margie for that. No, thank you. Take that back. Um, well done, Margie. So just so I, I went today and yesterday and just read a bunch of different of uh, school wellness policies on a lot of our neighboring communities. Mm -hmm. The wellness policy, school by school, very different. It, it's not like a template for from IASB in any way. It looks like they have to have you know certain uh, certain components. Mm -hmm. Ours is actually a lot more beefed up than most schools that I noticed. We have a lot more goal uh, you know more goals. Um, mm -hmm. So just just giving you my little history of what I, I learned today. So my guess is somewhere down the road, press will have more of its boiler template. It's a fairly new yeah. edition. Right. And a lot of the the documentation basically says like tailor. You know, your school district should tailor this to your needs and your concerns mm -hmm. uh, with these basic mandates. It, it's a work in progress. It's gotten a lot more emphasis, and quite honestly, it's really speaking to the whole child. Right. Yes. It's right. not just academic anymore. Right. It's right. I, I, I absolutely feel I good. think this is great uh, yeah. adding this uh, as an explicit too. goal. Of the wellness policy, adding right. the social emotional piece, I think is really important and necessary. Mm -hmm. um, there's one typo on the, the first goal. It says develop self-awareness and self-management skills to achieve school life and success. I think there should be, I think there's the end might be in a different place or something, but that's minor. The other thing I would, I would just maybe wonder about the very last sentence where it says what it says social emotional learning programs help develop students' self-regulation skills, social emotional competencies, in school and community connectedness. I, that's a statement of fact, but I maybe would take it out of, of, because this is a list of goals as opposed to statements of fact, I would sort of assume the facts are sort of understood and just list the goals in this section. That's, that'd be, those would be my two suggestions. But So to, you're saying the first one, to achieve school well, I don't know success, what it means. It says, or, yeah. uh, it says skills to achieve school life and success. I think it was supposed I, to be school I, and life success. That's, that's what, what I, I thought, I, right? That's what I figured, too. Um, and then... The and last I, sentence I would just take out because it's sort of underlying, yeah. that statement is underlying the whole purpose yeah. of having this and section. It, so it's kind of underst mm. un implicitly understood, I guess. Yeah. Right. And there's a, there's a sentence in the first introduction that I would remove too, just because I think it's, um, just, I don't think it's necessary for the policy. The second sentence in the introduction, it says a disturbing number of children are inactive and do not eat well. I, I don't think that adds to I, It's an editorial it, Yes, it's editorial. Yeah, it's yeah. already, it's, I don't think it's our productive. policy's already long. I don't think, I, I read that and I was like, uh. right. So if it's we're going aggressive. to be amending the policy, I would re I personally would Take recommend well. taking that line out. It's not um, really inspiring. <laughs> Yeah. I probably came out of my ESP. Yeah. <laughs> you think it did? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, sure it did. We took what was in there and added. Yeah. Pieces. They're really okay. good at this. <laughs> so, that if anybody goal. else has any yeah. comments, I, I think if we can that. tailor it to our, our goals that we accomplished for strategic yeah. plan and we did the whole climate and culture discussion, we had the table, you were in the, that group, and yeah. we can tailor it to those pieces even better. You know? I have a couple questions. Um, the first question is under that um, the goals for nutritional education. Mm -hmm. What was the logic behind answering um, adding with some emphasis on the impact of food allergies? Pam, I'm looking at there's, you. There's <laughs> concern, <laughs> we're concerned about increase of food allergies and severity of, of food allergies, and just to make students aware came from the committee about the different food allergies and to be. Um, cognizant of those allergies, that other students may have those allergies, and to be respectful of that. To your point, Rachel, the one comment I did, Pam and I did discuss at Cabinet the other day regarding this policy was we talked about the words health risks as well. And I don't know how the wellness committee would feel about that, but there's also the, the students with diabetes. That's what I was thinking. And too. there's a lot of other health mm -hmm. issues out there that are surrounding the nutritional piece, and it's part of the reason why mm -hmm. birthday treats and all that other stuff sort of right. became taboo was because mm -hmm. it's more than just the food allergy mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. And my only concern about that on the other side of the coin was isolating the food allergy students <laughs> from the, all other students who also may, you know, and having to be like, oh, it's the food allergy student ball right. that we're studying nutrition when really right. Right. there's lots of health risks right. that are impacted by the poor food. nutrition. I would support language like that. I would um, too. Because so I think that I it's, it's a much broader but, category mm -hmm. that should be captured there. And, you know, I, I don't know any of these, these laws um, very well. I've never read any of them, the ones that are cited at the bottom and what this is based on. 
But I would just ask the administration, this seems very, there are a lot of mandates in here, and I don't know how many of them are legal. This seems like a huge imposition, and I, and I go to the administration to ask, are, are these realistic? Is it required, and is it realistic to be able to attain all of these mandates within this? Uh, the state seems to think so when yeah. they pass legislation. And you know, we had a meeting today where we spent a lot of time talking about all the different types of testing right. and all the different right. programs that are coming in. And unfortunately, we're saddled with when legislation is passed, we have to respond to it. And are these necessarily good things? Not necessarily, not, right. not necessarily but are they things we have to do? And well, unfortunately, I can address part of your question, Rachel, too. Some of this is naturally embedded already in some of the curricular yeah. initiatives that mm -hmm. we have and mm -hmm. that we accomplish. So the physical activity pieces and the nutritional educational pieces, not with food allergy specifically, but we have curricular units in particular great levels that address some of those pieces mm -hmm. directly um, and intentionally as part of the curriculum requirements by the state. Um, there are others that are not as naturally embedded. Like everything that was added around social emotional is a piece of what we're already doing through our second step program, mm -hmm. as right. our social emotional mm -hmm. learning program. So I'm not as concerned about that. I mean, when Griff handed it to me, he's like, "This is your responsibility, so look at it." <laughs> you know, and I went make sure all it. these things are embedded. I went through it pretty carefully. Um, the, 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 this legislature has done so much yeah. uh, that it's 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 burdensome. And right. periodically, the, the uh, regional office of education has the charge of of reviewing everything that a school is doing. For example, it's legally required in high schools that the potato famine in Ireland be taught. <laughs> Only on Wednesdays. He's not the, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. It sounds like <laughs> the, yeah. when the regional office of education comes to audit the school system. I highly doubt that they're checking for compliance right. mm -hmm. in relation to that particular law. So there, are, I, th I think there are laws that are audited and there's a close scrutiny of, of, of compliance. And then there's probably a, lot, a bunch of laws, potato famine education maybe being one of them. A little more loosey-goosey. That are yeah, a little less uh, tightly uh, enforced or, or even considered all that important for a school district to be sure that they are, are following. Our, that, that's why it's it's beneficial when the state comes by and and does this complete review. Because they will look at all of your policies and then and then ask, you know, where are you complying? And, the and they, are, they are giving you feedback on what's important right. as to what I think maybe not be all that important. Well what about oh sorry, go ahead. And what we did was we were just everything in here except what's in yellow mm -hmm. is what was in board books mm -hmm. and that is kind of the state <coughs> work and we just added those other pieces and the social emotional learning was basically we thought it was important and surprised that the state has not put that in there as social emotional learning or some of our standards like right. would be surprised that in the future they wind up in there and mm -hmm. we could just take that language Right. It's it's yes, and this is just an opportunity because it's in front of us to we don't all go and study policy at night. Um, maybe Mary Rose does, but I, I certainly do not. And so it's just an opportunity. I read it read it through for the first time and was like, really? Um, especially that section under goals that promote student wellness in the school environment. It's 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 just you know about not bringing cake to school. You're telling you know and encouraging the parent organizations not to sell food. I'm like. Okay. That's like the word encouraged. Yeah. Right, right. But, but they are encouraged. I know that. Yeah, yeah. that's what I mean. That's She's not sell food to students. Anyway. Reading these they policies is a great way to fall asleep at night, though, Rachel. I mean, if you're having any insomnia, <laughs> insomnia you know, this issues. Is a, uh, noted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we could reinstitute reading them all again like we used to. But anyway, okay. uh, I guess we could. <laughs> yeah. I guess we can assume then that all the mandates in here are the one, are passed by law. Yeah, by that's what state. I just wanted yeah. to yeah. clarify. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And looking through other school policies, they have very similar goals, like the exact same goals: goals for physical activity. Go, you know, um, ours just seem to be more spelled out. Theirs okay. are a little more just general. We have goals for physical physical activity. Um, so, so is there consensus then to make some of those change? I can speak with. Um, Pam or Merrill about the health risk 
That's a good change. Language. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like it's more inclusive, and I'm right. hoping the food allergy people will understand that. Mm -hmm. I just I feel like we shouldn't be isolating one without right. acknowledging the other. Pointing out Great. The totally. People. Right. Oh. And then I'm not sure, Jeff had mentioned uh, the, the last goal <coughs> I added under social emotional learning. I'm not sure your feedback. Um, since this was created by, you know, this language was created by Pam and um, a social worker at Ames, what their thoughts behind it are, maybe we can follow up on that. And I would like to take out that second sentence in the introduction, if everybody's okay fine. with that. Um, Thank you. But if there is anything else as you're looking through this that you would like to let, you know, um, I feel like if we're updating this, we should just do a thorough job of it. So if you want to follow up with me, and then we'll bring it to second reading. Okay. Any? Okay. Oh, if I had if I had a change in the school day, which won't happen, but I'd like more recess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I don't think us changing the policy is going to I'm, affect that. I'm, totally just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so moving on to the press update, um, everybody's. Ex I know you've all read these completely, and you're very excited to I discuss them did. all. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> uh, se uh, the second item, policy six colon one three zero, program for the gifted. Um, it, it's just uh, one of the five-year review policy. It provides focus to the board to monitor the program. Um, and we're having an audit next year. So. Right, right. So we will be monitoring. I'm sorry, which one was that? Um, six colon one three zero, program for the gifted, item two. Mm -hmm. um, it seems very standard. So mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions or concerns? There's new um, requirements at the state for um, reporting out on advanced learners in terms of a data collection. So now they've amended the policy just to make sure that everybody's periodically reviewing it. Mm -hmm. of that. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to, again, because policy number four through 10 all relate to the same legislation that was passed. So I'm going to skip to 11 really quickly and talk about that. Um, student athlete concussions and head injuries. It's just an update in the legal references. So there's really no update to the policy, just the legal but references. our current policy is, is, is shorter than this one, isn't it? If you look at our current policy, is it not uh, shorter than this, um, the new one? Because I look quickly at, at the current one. The um, student athlete concussions and head yeah, injuries? Yeah, I thought it looked shorter to me, but I, maybe not. I, I thought it wasn't as long. The current this one was just updated in the last press update, too. So I'm not sure if oh, there's maybe, a. maybe the, OK. There's a delay. Because there. we already talked about this policy in, yeah. in the last. And the new. Right. OK. Yeah. When was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That um, just a few months I can ago. double check. No, though. no worries. Sorry, sorry. So policy four, items four through 10 all stem from um, they're reviewed and rewritten in response to the Illinois General Assembly Public Act 099-0456, amending school code concerning dis student discipline policies. And the goal of that is to, uh, like the language in the press update was, uh, eliminate the, the school to prison pipeline. <laughs> so basically trying to keep okay. discipline as education rather than exclusion. Um, so all of these policies were, were either rewritten, renamed, or, or looked at in response to this legislation. Um, these policies need to be updated by, they're effective the first school day of next, next school year. year. So okay. that's why we're looking at them now. Um, the, the main one is item number five, policy seven colon one nine zero student behavior. It was, it was renamed from student discipline to student behavior and completely rewritten, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Many, um, speaking with Griff about this, many of the items in there say, contact your bo board attorney. Mm -hmm. um, so we will be doing that. We will be passing this policy through our board attorney. But before we do that, we want to make sure that all anybody reading this policy has additional questions so that it's all done at once. Mm. So which one are you looking at now? Sorry, I am looking at policy 7 colon 190, student behavior. Okay. Did you are you are you just not are you, are you skipping the one before that? Or just simply, I only was skipping it because this one is the heart of it. Yeah. Policy seven colon one five zero was only looked at in this press update in response to the legislation, which re, re, okay. which you know reviewed. They're all related policies. They're all related. Right. Okay. Um, the heart of the the main yeah. policy that's changed is seven colon one nine zero. You're okay. right. Uh, not to well, skip just, over. Well, just on the seven one fifty, um, it did it looks like Griff made this change to modify this this a little bit. Yeah. To make it so that if a um, if the police want to um, interview a student, that the parent that the yeah. superintendent um, try to make sure that the parents or guardians are there 
Uh, this, this incident's happened. That, was, that happened this year, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember one of those. So instead of will attempt. Uh, we'll attempt to, right. actually, we'll do unless there's um, an immediate health or safety right. risk, right. essentially. That's a good idea. I had a um, Lombard police officer take a kid out in handcuffs last year before the parents. In fact, I no. think that could be a huge problem Ooh. in the community yeah. for the parents, every, everyone. Yeah, you have to unless there's like a yeah. you know, real, so this, real. So this yeah. policy, we would be recommending the language that Griff. Right. So I would just know that. Were the custodians of that child? That's right. The local parents. So I would like. I like this change that Griff has made. I, I completely I, agree. I think it's best practice to have yeah. that communication right, right there that minute because right. you don't want to have. I cannot imagine. It was not a taking my child from no. school. So. Um, so are we all in consensus of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Sorry, Jeff. I'm skipping. I was skipping no, around. No, it's fine, it's fine. As I was trying to organize this all in my head, it all was revolving around the seven colon one nine zero student discipline. Um, so. Before we pass this through the board attorney, I want to make sure everybody has a chance to really read through this and make mm -hmm. sure there are no additional questions. Well, one, one thing that caught my eye in, in 7190 is that they they want us to prohibit um, medical marijuana. Yes. Even right. though it's prescribed to the kid, and that seems to but, me crazy. It's like if it's medicine. if it's legal, if it's we, prescribed we, we by a doctor. We don't disagree with that because just think of the liability. If it is prescribed, right. saying, no, you can't have and it. you and can't have it, have and the child has a seizure and dies. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, right. Right. Yeah. right, which, and then that is clearly the one that says, contact your board attorney. Yeah. Right. So, right. so I, I think. Would, I would just, I would say, yeah. That's, that's, well, that's, considering the attorneys looked at this, I wonder what the well, rationale is behind this. Interesting you should say that, but um, I have a friend who works for a school law firm that shall remain nameless, and um, he, his firm has drafted an entire um, version of this policy for the districts that they service because of the complexity of the recommended policies. And so they, the firms are, I don't know about ours, I haven't spoken to our attorneys, but a lot of the firms are drafting their own versions because of the complexity and the way the press policy was developed. Okay. And the nuances yeah. in it. So. And I actually, friends at Gravely <laughs> said they do that from time to time and yeah. they will just provide it for so, all of their, and, yeah. and this, <coughs> And for all of their clients, and this sounds like this a is good one, one that they may be yeah. working on. I, yeah. It seems it's my my friend, complex colleague friend um, said he highly recommends that we definitely look to see. So if maybe our get something has, that's that's already been written by a law firm. That rather the law than, firm may have a suggested times. version that we can look at and compare it to. This. I like okay, that idea. I think mm -hmm. that's a great idea because I mean it is. Because I was asking him about it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a little strange. Yeah, he actually authored the one at their firm, so. I can get my hands right. on it. Contact if I can. Yeah. We have a firm. So. Is everybody in consensus with doing that? I, I certainly don't. I yeah. mean, so, I think this, so this is definitely a policy I think we need this, to take This our time. one, especially with the exclusion, is a very sticky one. And, That's right. and when the legislature passes legislation like they did, it's a nice open book for law firms to be able to uh, tweak things and rewrite them. But this is one that this probably a, really needs a real good look. Okay. No so, doubt about it. So we're all in consensus of that. That was. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you have any specific questions, let's make sure we compile all that so we mm -hmm. just have one. Um, is there anything else about policy 7190 that people would like to discuss? I, I did notice one thing. It said, um, it was talking about this, uh, the new legislation explicitly forbids zero tolerance policies. It does, however, provide an exception for um, weapons. <laughs> so I, I found that one to two years, right? So yeah, that <coughs> kind of. It forbids a zero tolerance policy for what? It explicitly forbids zero tolerance policies, period. <laughs> there were a number of districts, and I, I'll tell you one in, in particular in South Cook County that had so many lawsuits related to their zero tolerance policy, it cost them a fortune. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what's evolved now, that that's not an acceptable approach, zero tolerance, Isn't our except in the the, the weapon category. I thought that our bullying policy might be a, a zero tolerance policy, or at least has been in the past. I don't know if it's worth looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But at least it I does. Don't think it's no, you're not. I, the problem. I don't think zero it's zero tolerance is due yeah. process. Yeah, I don't right. think it's explicitly stated. Yeah. No. Zero if you have, if you have due process, then you're not invoking zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to provide due process. Right. So I, ju I just thought that was an interesting, uh, but it did, you know, it does prohibit, or it, it doesn't involve weapons, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which right. is good, you know. Well, yeah, <laughs> just I would think that might be one thing we might have zero tolerance on is a weapon at school. <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
The other part of that policy that I also would like them to take a real hard look at is regarding being on or off school grounds. If we're kind of, there's so much mm -hmm. new law coming out in that area about what's reasonably related to school and what's not, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's something that bears mm -hmm. scrutiny too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems this this policy is as written it has a lot, it's quite broad because it does talk about yeah. stuff going on off campus, you know, mm -hmm. online internet right. stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of stuff is so it does cover a lot of that. Yeah, I I, I completely agree with you, but it may be too broad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Which could be a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no other questions, I'll move on to the next item. This is really exciting. <laughs> Um, item six, uh, this is the exhibit, the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, which is new, a new exhibit three for policy seven colon 190. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, this is a sample template of a memora Memorandum of Understanding you would use with your local police uh, departments mm -hmm. to, if you want to create a, a very um, laid out version of how our policy and, and how they're going to you know um, so it's how to communicate with them right so I've heard from other from people like some pe some people are saying we have a really good relationship with our police departments um, is this a necessary step and then I've heard the other side too so I don't know um, this is just a recommended thing this is not these are just uh, exhibits of sample recommendations so um, I'm not sure what you guys feel about that What's your view on that? Well, I, the one incident that we had to deal with this year, it, it really worked out okay. I, I think a lot of it was just an initial reaction. I was dealing with an officer who wasn't familiar with middle school and I think wanted to react the way he would with a high school kid. And once we had a brief conversation, they were very cooperative and we waited till the parents were able to come. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, yeah, it's been a good relationship. Uh, had some time dealing with the, uh, the police on the uh, crossing guard. Mm -hmm. uh, agreement that we had and so spent some time with the chief and they've been very responsive I think it came out of the wellness committee they were concerned about a particular street crossing and maybe an additional crossing guard there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I made the call the police monitored mm -hmm. that particular intersection <coughs> didn't see a lot of kids crossing but they're going to go back the end of April when the weather is better yeah. so everything we've requested of them they've done a very nice follow-up on so I'm not sure that that's necessarily something that we really need to take a, a long look at. Mm -hmm. I think the relationship is there. Okay. Would it be fair to say that you don't need Exhibit E3 unless you actually are going to draft an Exhibit of Understanding and, you know, or mem Memo of Understanding? I don't see the point of putting a sample. Well, I think it's a good idea as far as a placeholder. If, yeah. If anybody okay. decides down the line to do it. And we do have samples of other of other documents in our mm -hmm. policies as well. So okay. I, I would agree that it's probably a good placeholder in case we need to go down that path. Okay. Um, but, but as of right now, I, I don't think you And need we don't work. need the um, the SRO, right, mm -hmm. the, for the resource officer. We don't officer. have a, <laughs> we no, don't we have don't a resource have officer, so we don't, will not be ever using the sample of that. Um, is there any questions on this? What, or is this? what is the resource officer exactly? It's like a police officer. Oh, police officer. Yeah, some no, villages okay. have assigned school okay. resource officers, yeah. designated school resource officers. Let's hope we don't get there. Yes, let's, yeah. hope, let's hope that just stays as a sample. In we the always have one at the high <laughs> school level, but that's a different group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so different it's a, somebody who works for the police department, but, but is assigned here. Yeah. Although I will say they did have a really good relationship for the high school kids, at least, and you get them familiar with the police that they don't it doesn't become yeah. as confrontational I don't think we need it here, which though. I think yeah. is a good thing yeah. but not that we need it for the little ones but or sometimes yeah. we'll have yeah. a designated one that I'll do like once a week be in the schools yeah so time. so are we in consensus that um, at this point we don't feel the memorandum of understanding is necessary Just a place mm -hmm. yes perfect moving on policy uh, item 7 policy 7 colon 200 suspension procedures again this was rewritten in regards to the legislation um, let me find where I'm at. I don't have that one. I don't have my, I can't find my notes about what it was. Yeah, no, I wrote notes on each oh, one. I'm just notes. trying to find, okay. just from what I remember though. It there, designates the difference between in school and in out school of school. In school and out of now school. Now we need to do more in school before we go back. Right. I'm and always a fan of that as a teacher. I yeah. think I'd rather have them in our hands where we can be with them and educate them and Having them at home, I think, does them no good unless they're a danger. I just think yeah. that's 
The only That's thing it job. did note is that there is in the law there are no statutes regarding in school suspension, so we'd have to make sure we have our own procedures set up. Mm -hmm. I think that was the one note it had. So I'm not sure if anybody has anything to add to that or anything they want to say. Just out of curiosity, how common is our suspensions? I mean, are they do we have a lot of them per year? Or I, mean, I, I, I would say from what I've been able to tell this year, very few. A, f a couple of in school. Yeah, but notes. I, out of my head, we probably had um, three all year long. Three, yeah. and how long is the duration typically of a suspension? Um, one day. Just one, so three one day suspensions. So this isn't really a big deal for us then. No. Very honestly, I've been in a lot of places. These are the nicest kids we're I've ever lucky. worked with. Yeah. yeah. Very lucky that way. And you got a lot of that feel when you were listening to right. the uh, two Hoser teachers mm -hmm. speaking yeah. about what they've been mm -hmm. doing this year. Um, so it sounds like we're all good with that. The next policy, policy 7 colon 210, is expulsion procedures. Again, rewritten in regards to the legislation. Um, again, from what I understand, it's not, you know. It's, it's a last resort. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it, uh, reading through the policy, it seems to make sense. Yeah. Um, so no comments on that one. <laughs> Uh, bus conduct uh, policy 7 colon 220 bus conduct really doesn't relate to us much because we don't have busing however again it was just it just explicitly states in there that when you are on a bus you have to follow the the code of conduct put forth in policy 7 colon 190 um, take field trips so yeah, yeah so basically out. it's just making it, it was just adding this new rewritten policy into the bus conduct mm -hmm. very straightforward and and also the next policy, 7 colon 240, code of conduct for participants in extracurricular activities. Same thing, it's just making sure that, uh, it's explicitly stating that in extracurricular activities, students are expected to follow the same discipline code. Right. So all of these policies are just geared back towards policy 7 colon 190, which we're gonna have further work done on, okay. or look into it further and talk to the attorneys. So that's all the policies, There's, I know. <laughs> Can we have a teacher talk again? <laughs> <laughs> I, Linda, I thought yours was much more interesting. Than, oh, you know. right. <laughs> Just a, a suggestion. You pointed out that you're listing a lot of policies under the press update that aren't part of the press yes, update. Yes, I. The title that we, I guess we used in I, the past was board policies currently yeah. under review. I, I, I'm, I made note of that. Okay. I don't know if <laughs> the agenda just wasn't updated, but it, yeah, moving forward it will be. Well, I just went and looked at what we called it. Yeah. And then there is also a whole section that we did periodically. Apparently we're supposed to look at our policies um, every five years, and the IASB gives us a list. Now, in this case, they changed, they actually changed a couple. But I, but, but we have They no. do. They, in the last press update, we had a whole list of the five-year reviewed policies. All right, but... Mm -hmm. It, they were brought to it. There was like four of them that were we, okay. we talked about. So yes, the so they're doing that automatically. They are doing that. Yeah, they give you the list, I guess. Yes, yeah. and it was uh, three of them from the last press update were the five-year review, and one of them from this one is. Yeah, but these were actually changed. Right. Yeah, because they give you a whole list of five reviews that are not which they're not recommending. But they recommend the board looks at it anyway. Anyway, we right. had another category. There were three titles that we had. That's okay. the only thing I'm mentioning. Okay. Okay. And so, on that, I'm I'm done. I will move. Andy, the gavel over. Mr. Regan. Oh, thank you. Oh wait, unless there's something else. Uh, ju oh. Just just a reminder on the board secretary, um, you know that policy. I would like to know if there are currently election duties um, and what they are. Right. Election duties. Really and Linda, I believe most of those are, are straight to the county clerk's office at this point. They, They've taken a lot of that stuff away. Yeah. But we can double check. Right? I, know, I can't imagine having gone through that, what could be possibly yep, left that, that they on, don't do. There. Yeah. 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 There, I noticed there's still one listed mm -hmm. there. At so. office. Yeah. So, in just one final note, if you do have a policy you would like to be reviewed, if you could just let me know directly, that would be great because I was I got a little surprised yesterday. I didn't, by I didn't ask for them to do anything. Okay. With it. I just pointed uh, it out. I'm I'm just stating it, um, just so that I can be in the loop and and try to do some of my own work research. So, yeah. do you have, I mean, do you have any suggestions? I mean, as the policy chair of things that we should be thinking about in the future, like the next you know, six months or like general um, topics or general At policies. this moment, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, Linda, um, there, wa uh, there is a list from uh, the minutes when we used to do the working committee of 
Right. There's, there's a list of things that uh, w it was recommended at the time be looked at and okay. customized. A couple of them were to dovetail with the um, CBA. So I mean okay. that list exists. And, okay. And, and I if you I, could, I asked you last time if you could send that to me, um, if you want those re-looked at, because I I'm not exactly. I, I have must have lost some of the documentation or you know so if, you, if there's anything that you would like to be looked at please please send to me and no, I, gladly. Yeah, I, like I said I'll, I'll take a look at it I believe I've sent them a couple times but that's all right I'll I'll take a look I don't have a strong commitment uh, to changing any of them outside of the fact that if they are CBA related they probably should be looked at okay and I would just like us um, especially when Martha comes on for us to talk about our, our strategic plan right, and see is what is it that we're attempting do to they, do and, and do, do we need policies policy yeah. that, that require changes. Good. I think that's a good starting point. Um, so I'd like point. to include Martha, obviously, when yeah, she comes on. That's, and, and I know I think there's been interest in the past of uh, looking at the hiring procedures mm -hmm. and policies around that and um, suggestions. And I, again, think that might be something we want to wait for Martha on so those are the you, yeah those are the only two things I was thinking but, but if that's you guys for me our working other. business um, soon so I'd like to tailor it Mr. Regan all right yeah I'm, I'm <laughs> done you your time ready. finance you guys are you're done 845 thank you Linda that was scintillating <laughs> <laughs> for me as well thank yes. you you know <laughs> So Mr. Sellers has some reports prepared for us with uh, staff recommendations, financial project projection, as well as uh, an update on summer projects. Well, the uh, <clears throat> this document was pre prepared in response to a request to uh, cost out the financial impact of, of recommendations that were um, uh, presented to the board um, at the last meeting 4.5 uh, net with with changes in you know among those uh, the total of 4.5 of certified staff uh, was approved by the board so at this point I think it's probably uh, Mr. Pat's um, uh, the additional your, things that we your, had your turn to to take over and describe some classified staff or, or non certificate Well, this was this was the thing that I had uh, handed out in December. What I called perceived gaps in the system, and I think uh, Mr. Sellers actually built this into his projections. Uh, the fact that I think it's very important, and, and Linda can speak to this one when we did one of those follow-ups after one of the board meetings. Uh, you know, people were really thinking, oh, "Boy, right. the the nurse category and, and a couple of others like that." And I think we really have have filled all the gaps right now except for the fact that Hauser has a point eight two nurse and I had recommended back in December that we take a look at that and, and make that person full time and that we have a a nurse that goes in between Blythe Park and Hollywood and you have the early childhood program at Hollywood and yet half the the week there is no one there in the medical field covering that area so the recommendation was to hire another full-time health aide in this case and probably Pam I would think that if we had a you know the nurse that goes between Blythe Park and Hollywood and if we hired a health aide we would probably skew and, and have the actual nurse probably based more at Hollywood because of the early childhood program it may depend year to year on the actual medical needs, medical needs. <laughs> but at least that would give us the flexibility to be able to cover both buildings and the other part of the perceived gap was to set up aims structurally as uh, having two secretaries in the office as opposed to a secretary and the two midday assistants that are there at this point uh, you have a number of secretaries uh, whether they're willing to admit it or not I think it's kind of floating around right now that you have a few secretaries that are not too far away from retirement and they're looking, you know, possibly in the next couple of years to retire. And I think it would be good to have some, you know, some cross training. And, and as we did, uh, I think it was back probably in September, you know, we took a look at the central school situation and created a, a second secretarial position at central. And I think that was the, uh, the final part of the perceived gaps, adding a, a 0.18 uh, to the nurse at Hauser. Uh, a full-time health aide that would cover the situation between Blythe Park and Hollywood and then an additional secretary at Ames uh, replacing the two midday assistants. 
And I think, uh, David, I think you said you built that into the financial projection. Yeah, for, you, you know, I, I think it's important that the board understand mm -hmm. the, the, the I mean, there's complexity um, from year to year, you know, f and, and so in order to try and make it clear, there are pages in your materials. One is, is titled resignations and retirements, mm -hmm. and then the next page is titled replacement hires. The, the, the FTE total at the bottom of those two pages is identical, mm -hmm. and it's identical in each category. So basically, everything's going to be captured on those two pages mm -hmm. for which there is a one-for-one -one identical replacement due to resignations and retirements. In the, in, on the next two pages, you have additions and subtractions, and the additional positions um, are listed in the in the non-certificated as the um, 1.0 um, secretary, uh, 0.18 part-time to full-time nurse, and then 1.0 nurse or 2.18. A subtraction is the elimination of two middays, and that's on the next page, uh, 0.59 and 0.59. So when you go to the summary, it's showing a net of 1.00 of a, of a staffing increase in the non-certificated area. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, it, you know, the, the, in, the information is, is understandable mm -hmm. in this format mm -hmm. where you're, you're seeing the, the, you know, pure replacement and then where you're, you've got a, additional positions or an increase in FTE mm -hmm. if everything else were staying the same and then subtractions where you have an, a, a decrease. So. At this point, the recommendation is for a 1.0 net of all of those changes. I think that um, that Mr. Pat's raising you know many uh, uh, valid points here about you know what would be desirable and having an extra nurse at the elementary schools, um, you know, replacing the, the two part times with it with a full timer. Uh, those are those are desirable things, but I guess my question is, what's the cost? Um, I know it's built in through your projections. From what I can tell from the projections, it looks like if everything is, if all of your assumptions are correct, we start going and drawing on our reserves in 2020. So in mm -hmm. four years, we start deficit spending. Is that, is that, do I read that correctly? Just the very last bottom right corner of your uh, table, excess of revenues over expenditures. Um, and that's positive up until 2020, where, where I see it kind of going to zero. Is that right? Well, I don't. I'm looking at this page. The that, very first page, yeah. Shows so, uh, 2021. 2020, yeah. So that 2020. Five years out, uh, we go to zero. So that's when we start going deficit right. spending, basically. So well, that's or, that's under these four years from now, under the assumption yeah. that. Well, it's, it's not deficit spending. It's it's balanced budget. We start at drawing zero. our reserves, basically. We, yeah, it, the, 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 the very, very bottom line is one that is mm -hmm. near and dear to my heart mm -hmm. because I like to support mm -hmm. facilities improvements. You know, I'm a business official. So $800,000 per year mm -hmm. is affordable mm -hmm. under this projection. Uh, it's in year five in 2021 mm -hmm. when you'd be cutting back on your ability to strongly fund facilities improvements out of your regular operating resources. Right. And uh, at that point, you have 91.5% of a year of expenditures mm -hmm. uh, in cash reserves unreserved. Right. So at that point, we have to start cutting back on our capital expenditures, and also we are no longer running a, a, an excess of, um, of revenue versus expenditures. Correct. Th this, this, this projection is, is the case with all projections is a subject to many many assumptions. Yeah, so I'm not going to hold. It. I'm not going to come back and yeah, years very, and say we. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's supposed to be the yeah. the, the, the the middle case scenario, right. understanding that there's variance. Your your percentage increases, it should be noted, on revenues, <coughs> are a pretty uh, modest uh, pretty projection conservative projection. Two point two, one point seven, one point eight, one point six, and one point six. And that's assuming that a, a you know a difficult scenario with the uh, CPI mm -hmm. continues, and, right. and a 0 0.7 CPI coming in for 2017-18 mm -hmm. 
was was not good news for all school districts mm -hmm. under the tax cap. Right. The other question I guess I have in this context is if I if I look at your your table on the second page, you have um, a table of how the number of staff have changed through time, and in the top part of the table you look at um, <coughs> certified faculty. Um, that's the first part of the table, mm -hmm. and in 2013-14. There were 125 full-time equivalents, and uh, next year we'll have 145. So that's an increase of 20 um, over these um, three years, yeah, which is about 16 percent. And at the same time, the number of students in those four years or three years has basically been flat. There's been no change in the number of students, roughly. So I guess. I, I see. I see, I see uh, a lot of growth here in staffing. And, um, and, and, and looking at the individual categories, it, school the mm -hmm. there has been growth in the elementary and the junior high, mm -hmm. but there has been significant growth in psychologists, social workers, and and I I'd, I'd have to do a retrospect, a historical analysis, but some of these were services that we were. Oh, Contracting right. with right. lads, that's so right. even, that's even the elementary, even the yes. elementary so teachers, we went from seventy-three to eighty-two. So that's right. nine. Right. Number of students are the same. Well, uh, we, high school, we've gone from forty-six to fifty. We added the ECE program or the um, the preschool, the blended okay. preschool program. So when that that I'm not sure how many. Yeah. Right. So and, and, and just in the uh, the recent thing the board did with the additional four point five FTE positions, right. mm -hmm. three of those were, were basically yeah, mandated. Bilingual. Right. I'm not. They're I'm not. Saying, what, I'm yeah. not. Just be clear. I'm not. I'm not saying yeah. this is wrong or yeah. bad no, no. or just we're questioning. Right. right. No. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying that we've seen a sixteen percent increase in the number of full time mm -hmm. equivalent employees in three years, and the number of students is exactly the same uh, within twenty or something like that. So like. You know, we've hired. We're hiring four and a half new people next year, equivalent. I just like at some point we have to say, well, and then we're four years from now we're going to be running out of money. Not running out of money, but at least starting to go deficit. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just saying, like we have to be a little bit careful about whether um, the things that are desirable, which you know, all these things are, are desirable, are actually affordable Doable. in, the long, in right. the long run. Well, a again, not knowing what the future holds, but you know, the kindergarten class that we have this year is one of the smallest. So far. And yeah. we still don't have a really large enrollment at kindergarten at this we're point. We're about the same. As we were. Years down the road, you may be looking at the enrollment dropping, which in turn would create the need to cut certain positions, mm -hmm. except obviously the mandated ones. Mm -hmm. And so your, your revenue flow probably will be what David is projecting, where the expenditures won't be because if you lose a couple of salaries every mm -hmm. year over a, a three, four year period, that's a substantial difference in money too. So yeah. there's so many variables in this equation. You know, I, I applaud David for being able to project it out that far, but I don't think he'd want to be held to an exact number four or five years down the road. Mm -hmm. May I approach the bench? I mean, can I, can I, can I, I'd like approach to, the bench? I'd like to pass out. No, don't another, pass out. Another Just consideration, and this actually relates to the next topic of the or, two topics of discussion later, and that is where we are with our current fiscal year. Mm -hmm. The current fiscal year is, is looking good. The, the projection that you have is based upon budget, and, and once we that conclude budget. the current fiscal year, we'll have to you know, revise the projection. Uh, right now we're, we had a $2.047 million uh, balance of revenues minus expenditures, um, and it looks like we're we're going to come out about four hundred and thirty-nine thousand um, dollars to the good, stronger. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, so, I just want to interrupt you for a second, David. And David, I think does something very similar. I did these things for twenty-two years. I would always underestimate the revenues and right. overestimate the expenditures, mm -hmm. so that what the budget looked like at the end of the fiscal year was as David is saying, you know, a lot more positive. And, and, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, you know, engage in an argument here. I'm, I'm, what I'm, what I, because, because your point is very well taken. The, the, the CPI, mm -hmm. looking into the future, if it stays at, at 0 0.7 going on to the future, then the school district would probably be looking at having to cut staff. Mm -hmm. You know, right. because staff mm -hmm. is really your your largest cost. So, so I mean that's. People, people are given an opportunity to have an employment contract for a year, mm -hmm. and then at the end of that time, uh, we're all subject to layoff. 
Um, and, and so, you know, the, the boards of education do have to consider uh, cutting uh, when their fiscal uh, resources uh, tighten up. So, I, again, this is a financial projection that's supposed to be a middle case scenario. I just wanted to apprise you. And when we get into the discussion of the math financial implications, mm -hmm. um, the conclusion of our current fiscal year is, is worth your, your looking at. I have a question about the 800,000 kind of number for the facilities. Knowing what you know about what we want to do with playgrounds and with roofs, and, um, do you think that's reasonable? Do you think that's a, knowing all the things that we want to do, I'm saying, do you think it should be bigger? Or <laughs> what well, we've been talking about doing, or is it on a low number for us? Or? I, 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 I sometimes scale it based on my own experience. Okay. Um, and at, at a, where I used to work was probably about twice the magnitude at 1.3 million square feet under roof. Okay. This school district has about 252,000 square feet Give under roof. Give or take roof. a couple, right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the expectation where I used to work is about 1.7, 1.8 million dollars per year. Mm -hmm. Doing 800,000 per year with 250,000 square feet under roof. Seems reasonable. Knowing that we've had a lot of discussions about various things. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, there if you start talking about constructing a, a kindergarten facility, Whole different uh, thing, yeah. then, then you're talking about accessing bonded debt right. capacity. Right. That's kind of a different type of an okay. initiative. And I have one other question that I know you don't have the answer to, but um, I'm always worried about state implications for pensions and things like that. Do you have any worst case scenario <laughs> advice for what we should do in the event that things come down to us? Should we be preparing? You know what well, I'm saying? I, my, my flippant, and I, or rather off the cuff or knee jerk reaction yeah. to that would be that the state of Illinois, ha, in all of their discussions of these gloom and doom mm -hmm. uh, types of financial impacts on school districts, have always said that there would be some phase in time. A gradation, right? yeah. Right. During that phase in time frame, you sit down with your unions. You sit down with your entire staff and you say, mm -hmm. look at what's on the horizon. We're all going to have to tighten our belt together. Right. Okay. And, I, and I think that school districts, you know, may be facing that. The state of Illinois is going to give us some lead time. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, a three-year uh, contract with your, uh, you know, as a collective bargaining mm -hmm. agreement mm -hmm. is probably the most you want to do is three years okay. uh, based on or put in some type of a language that says that there's an opener on salary if the state of Illinois offloads pension uh, obligations. So okay. that's, that's a huge Yeah, I know, I know that impact. was a uh, devil's advocate kind of question. I'm just, it concerns me because you never get an answer about budget from the state and I don't know what to do. They haven't passed they the have budget. budget. No, they, it wasn't even on the, it was no not the agenda today, so. They don't have any money. Yeah, so I was just throwing that out there for what do we what do people like us do with yeah it? the only thing you can say though is and, and david verify this if something like that happens you know the catastrophic stuff mm -hmm. probably 800 and some school districts in the state will go down faster than this right. one will. oh i know i mean you're I in a that. you're in a very yeah. nice position in a lot of ways i get it but we have so many cool things we want to do oh and, and, you know. and, and <laughs> just listening to the hauser teachers tonight and what's yeah. happening at the right. middle school I mean, you've got some fabulous things going on. Mm -hmm. And honestly, when I did that thing in December, all I did was I looked at the overall picture and I said, if I were able to fill certain slots, mm -hmm. this is what I would do. Right. Yeah, things are desirable. Right. One question I have is about the paraprofessionals at Ames. That we have two, two of them currently. And two uh, uh, midday assistants. Mid -day assistants right. And you're proposing to replace that by once a one secretary. one secretary right but it would cost us more to well have be, a because secretary. you have the uh, the uh, the deed for all of the other uh, things that go with it mm -hmm. the, I, I'm blanking on the word benefits. the, pro benefits. the uh, other benefits benefit. yes insurance okay. coverage yeah. that type yeah. of thing that's really what drives the additional cost more okay. than anything yeah um, David a I think I've asked this question before, but I'm not sure I remember or understood the answer. A couple of years ago, we hired a, a bunch of LADSI staff, mm -hmm. and they, you know, instead of going to LADSI, you know, we have them on staff. And I guess my question is, did that help or hurt us financially? Is there a way to measure that? 
um, or if it was a good idea for I, other I reasons so. as well. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know that a clear answer of that is possible because every year you have a different mix of population of students. student population being served. Your 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 two point three seven eight million peak of LADSI tuition and other is is now uh, for the current fiscal year 1.641 million and it looks like according to our uh, year-to-date results is going to come in about 1.576 you know let's say 1.6 million what exhibits are you looking at I'll probably look at it later uh, well it's the first page the financial first projection the row is titled LADSI slash right. tuition slash other so the, the reduction from 2.4 million down to 1.6 million is an $800,000 reduction right. in cost, or let's say 750,000. Okay. The the uh, the benefit of doing that is going to be partially uh, uh, shifted into the salaries that that Dr. Miller was just noting, but not to that degree the re I'd say probably maybe a certain portion of the of that 800 700,000 is is that cost benefit of, of bringing those LADSI people in in house but the vast majority of it is uh, fewer students and at any time that that is an area that you should always worry about if you want to think about things to lose sleep over um, seeing that cost category balloon suddenly in any given year is certainly a possibility. Right. Fortunately, Control. over time, you know, you, you know, when we're doing budgeting, we're, we're kind of looking at, at what we expect to be a midpoint. I think for me, it's it's all about the child's care. So whether we, if we brought the person here, is it better for the child than? We have to do it. I just don't think you have more control that it's, way. Too. Well, and it's yeah. it's more consistent for us. Maybe I, maybe Pam can speak to that better. Right. But it's, um. it's dependent upon the child's needs, right? Of course, but right. um, you know, whenever you know our goal is and our mandate is to have children in the least restrictive right. environment, right. whenever we can do that, that should be our, our mission. Right. But yeah, I, I mean, I think we all agree that we, you know we want the best for the child, but I'm just. I, I don't think there's going to be a really clear answer to your question, and yeah. the reason why it's unclear and will probably remain unclear is the difficulty of of factoring in a completely different mix of students. Right. So is is it is it helpful or easy to have that line along with the student population each year that are served by that staff? Or? Yes, I, I in fact. Are that's, you talking about the enough. staff we've absorbed or the kids that are outplaced? Well, actually, both. That's a good suggestion. I can add that to this exhibit. This is an exhibit that's in your budget preparation materials, and uh, at the bottom of each of these columns, we can put the uh, okay. the fall housing enrollment number. We could also put the number of special education students that are are being served. I'm, I'm accustomed to those types of statistics also being included. I just you know, didn't think of it when producing that particular well, exhibit. It's a, it's a lot of numbers, no doubt. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other curious. questions for David on staff or financial projections? Uh-uh. Great. You want to move along? Move on to facilities. So I have, I have four topics to cover pretty briefly, I, I think, I hope. Um, Blythe Park Windows Replacement Project. Uh, Mr. Pat and I uh, visited Blythe Park um, and looked at the Cigna Systems sample installation. Mm -hmm. It is notable that the profile of the window has a, uh, you know, there is additional material that reduces the the size of the pane. You know, what is what is glass. Mm -hmm. So in other words, mm -hmm. you could have a. You know, here's the here's the window space that you can see through. Mm -hmm. It's just slightly less window space that you can see through. So the mullion or the frame is larger than yes. what was existing. Yes. How big is that effect? Is it? It's yeah. about a it's it's a half, half inch. inch. Yeah. Might even be yeah. It's, it's a half inch all the way around. But to both of us, it didn't really look very different, except for the fact that the window space was. Uh, We're looking at it from the standpoint different. of. Uh, 
of uh, people who, who <laughs> would apply this to our own home ownership, right. uh, not to not, someone who is, right. who is faithfully trying to uh, achieve a, a true historical preservation. Mm -hmm. So I did call Mr. Pipel, Charles Pipel, mm -hmm. this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I, I apprised him of the uh, installation being uh, available for his review, and that will take place. I think he just, the way he you know, indicated over the phone, I imagine he'll be over there within the next few days, okay. and the Riverside Historical Commission will give us feedback. If they're if they're really unhappy with with it, then I'm sure they'll let us know. Um, if they give us a thumbs up, then we have a potential to save over a half a million dollars. Okay. Um, because all of our, and I, I'm saying that with some confidence, in that uh, Mr. Radke and I have both contacted Cigna <coughs> Systems customers, and the claim, well, first of all, they they give you a 10-year warranty. Okay. Ten years is a pretty good amount of time, and their their past installations are now 20 to 30 years old in a number of cases, and you have customers that say, no, these windows are not fogging up. We're continuing to, to experience the benefit of going from single pane to double pane mm -hmm. with all of the energy efficiency improvement that that uh, new, you know, that additional layer of glass Double, uh, single pane to double pane provides. Is the seal um, is it supposed to be airtight, or is it just is it is it? Open? I mean, can the air go back and forth between the two panes? I thought he used the word hermetically sealed. Sealed, yeah, airtight. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not like magnetic. And he's and he's he's very confident. I mean, he, okay. you know, if you just talk to this guy, he's got a very thick accent, but he's as confident as can be. What's, what's in between the glass? Is it just air, or is he, is he suck the yeah. air out in a vacuum, just, or is it? Yeah, it's or, a, I think it's a vacuum okay. sealed. Okay. Um, vacuum sealed during installation. I asked him, you know, how competent and reliable are your installers? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And he said, well, my son is one of them and he's going to take over the business <laughs> once I retire <laughs> and he will honor the warranty uh, or maybe his grandkids or whatever. But either way, he's, he's confident that they're going to stay in business and that the installations are being done by people who know what they're doing. Because obviously they have to be done correctly but a 10-year warranty means that if we have a glass, you know, something that fogs up mm -hmm. yeah. and there's obviously a leak mm -hmm. in the window, right. we have recourse for even 10 if, years. Even if, you know, yeah, you know, you'd occasionally invite them back to, to fix a window. It's not a big deal. No, that's right. Like yeah. Yeah. No. But it's, I, I, I asked uh, Ms. Gorman what she thought when she looked at it and, you know, she had a positive view as far as... I thought it was, it looked almost... I, like so I couldn't tell from the inside at all. Right. On the outside, there was there is a little bit of, of difference, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. You know how to start saying how they would. It is, yeah. As Mr. Summer said before, we look at things from the standpoint of if it was right. our house, right. what right. would we do? Right. And there's no way that we would spend the extra half a million dollars to make it look a, a little bit different, maybe more historically preserved. Mm -hmm. I'll be curious to hear what Charlie Piper has did to did say. Any, wasn't it the State Historical Commission that told, told you yes, about this? Right. Well, when, we, when we met with Mr. Piper, you know, one of his mm -hmm. comments was that the state of Illinois has authority to step in and, uh, you know, and maybe this is too strong a word, but prohibit doing something to uh, a, a historical landmark or whatever. In this case, uh, Carol Dyson is the chief architect for the state of Illinois. I can't imagine there being an objection coming mm -hmm. from the state of Illinois because it's a system that they actually have Adults. said has yeah. been successful right. in other locations. Right. And as Casimir is, indi is indicating, you, you do see the original material. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that there's a a preservation quality aspect or, or value to that. You, you are you are maintaining uh, the existing steel Windows. material. Mm -hmm. so Are there any board they members that want to? They were there over spring break about 7:30, and I don't think they left until after one. So they were there for about 30 minutes. Huh. And it was like the window right next to my office. Mm -hmm. Just one, so just one window. Is it, it took them yeah, they were, five hours? They were there for a long. Okay. So I know that they were being. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we've sent them. About, about the 
we've sent Cigna the drawings, mm -hmm. you know, the architectural. So they, they and they came in came back with a quote of uh, under three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, it's likely that if we went with the highest cost, uh, hopes steel windows, we'd be talking one point two million, mm -hmm. maybe one point three million, including uh, asbestos abatement. Mm -hmm. So one point three million, including asbestos abatement, as compared to under three hundred thousand right. dollars, you don't have to do any asbestos abatement with this right. Cigna system. Do they touch it up, the paint and all that? Because some of the paint's peeling. Now. Yeah. Is, are they, are they, is that, does that include it? They are doing some touch up, okay. but it's on the exterior of the building. Okay. They're not, you know, they're not going inside the building envelope. But they're doing we're, some When they're done, work. the window's going to look like new. It's not going to be like cracked paint or anything like that. Is that no, correct? and, and I, I, you know, I, I invite every board member, if you have time to, take a, look. to yeah. take a look. It's right on the opposite side of, if, if you're at, at, at uh, it's on the park side uh -huh. and right next to the, the principal's office. Right. So in respect to that entrance on that western facade, mm -hmm. which way mm -hmm. is it? Is it left or right? It's the west. It, yeah. It's the southwest it's the, corner. It's the west, it's west wall. Okay. And it like, goes towards the, like, the southern west side. Okay. Yeah, the southern entrance on the west side. Okay. Got it. Just okay. to the left of that. Might okay. be the best way to put it. Opposite that playground. Yeah. I yeah. Can, I can Opposite the playground. Yeah. 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 I was gonna say. <laughs> there, there you go. I see people sneaking around. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I <laughs> so you don't think? I mean, as far as the <laughs> teachers is. So, Kasmira, I'm sorry to ask your question, but you don't think that you know the students and teachers? It's not going to impact the way that they interact with their space or the light or anything like that. No. You, you can hardly I tell, think, except for. Yeah. I think the chilliness by the window is more that's intrusive. That's right. A lot more. Right. Thanks. Great. I think it'd be good for any board member that can swing by. Yeah, absolutely. Take a look I'll definitely try and do that. It would, uh, you know, it'd be helpful us for us to have that insight as David talks about this in the coming months. Yeah, absolutely. Where should we swing by? Blythe. Blythe. Blythe Park. Where, where the Just window. look at the window. The one window that was installed. But don't worry, we won't scare you in the middle of the day or anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would just go to go to the principal. <laughs> I suggest you go to the principal's office, check in, and have somebody right. take. That's your right. Room. Yeah. Okay. I'll go after school hours. <laughs> paving project. Creepy lady. Uh, <laughs> paving project, uh, the striping plan is is being reviewed by uh, Principal May and Principal Gatz. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, just, you know, I learn something every day. Um, I've learned that they have some ideas for some changes. And, um, and so they're in the process of, of bringing forward uh, some of their ideas and what I'd like to emphasize right now is that we have time. Uh, we had a pre-construction meeting this afternoon mm -hmm. uh, with MJ uh, paving. Uh, we don't have to give them a final striping plan until I, I actually said the middle of May. Actually, they actually said the end of May. So you didn't hear that. He's yeah, you didn't hear that. Of actually, it's the end. I, of I tell everybody two weeks. Uh, you know, give myself some lead time, leeway. So we have plenty of time to make some uh, decisions. The um, that so that's the striping plan mm -hmm. regarding the the bicycle. Uh, we we have within the bid specifications uh, slots for 116 bicycles that are Hauser only to go. The the um, we added uh, replacing the bicycle racks at, at Hollywood. So we would be going to um, uh, let me let me think. It's a hundred and it's two hundred and sixteen at uh, Hauser Central, thirty at Hollywood. So it would be two hundred forty-six. So we're, we're we're more than doubling. We're going from one hundred and sixteen <laughs> to two hundred forty-six. More than doubling, and the cost of that is uh, approximately twenty-seven thousand dollars. Now that includes concrete footings in probably 80 percent of that of that uh, quantity uh, there's some thought about having a greater number of those uh, bicycle racks be movable right but we need to we need to I thought that's we what need to still explore some some yeah. uh, strengths and weaknesses of that recommendation mm -hmm. I don't want buildings and ground staff moving 250 pound uh, bicycle racks on a regular basis so we have to be we have to you know, examine the, the pluses and minuses of, of alternative ideas. Right now, 
I, I don't know where this is going to, to land in terms of a recommendation. So I'd call this a malleable and still uh, under We're the heading fighters. of brainstorming. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, if, if $27,000 is the worst case scenario, uh, now you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. as far as cost is concerned. The reason why it's so much money is that the, the, the original spec was for these things called, that are called wave racks, and going to the U-shape racks is, is more than twice the cost. And then the installation with the U-racks includes um, footings to hold them, you know, to secure. Anyway. I, we, we've asked for the uh, for M and J Paving to come back to us again. They had two companies that they were working with, and uh, they need to come back to us with a greater level of detail. We need to know exactly how many were, um, you know, additional as compared to what was in the bid, and we don't think right now that they're giving us full credit as right a number. deduct. For what was in the bid, mm -hmm. so right, you know, whenever you, whenever you've already awarded a bid and you're going at a contractor yeah. for a deduct, mm -hmm. yeah. that that can become an issue. Right mm -hmm. now, they're only calculating the deduct for the 116 rack at, at Hauser <laughs> as a $4,800 deduct, right. mm -hmm. and we think that's baloney. Mm -hmm. So, uh, respectfully, <laughs> um, so we're we're gonna we're gonna you know work with them on that, and I'd say we'll have an update. Uh, within the next, you know, couple weeks, but um, a lot has to be discussed and massaged before we come up with a final recommendation that I think everyone will be comfortable with. I have or, a minor, or maybe there there'll be a recommendation that not everyone is comfortable with. Have a but we have to recommend question. something. <laughs> minor question about the movability of them. I I thought I understood during the wellness report that they would only be moved for the snow plows. And would you consider that a regular basis for movement? I'm just, <laughs> couldn't we go with the standing feature on an everyday situation? I mean, how often does that happen that they'd be moved? Because that would save a lot to not have the poured footings. Just well, I, I, I guess the them being movable, um, I, I know we have very, very well behaved students, but we don't want to have to have an ongoing operational hassle with, you know, with kids, uh, you know, getting them out of kilter and, or, or, or even in a mischief fashion moving them around. We do, in other words, you know, we, do, we don't want to have bike racks that, <laughs> that can become a nuisance happening, because they get moved me. around <laughs> by the kids. So okay, that's just that's, maybe what that's I understood a from the presentation. But. Um, on the other hand, uh, we're looking at the area where, as I'm sure you've seen, there's uh, parking of pods for the theater, mm -hmm. yeah. and and those that's a kind of a dead space that uh, principals uh, May and Gats are looking at how we might incorporate that space into our discussion of of where how, where our bike racks are and how they're utilized. Okay. The question then becomes how many bicycle uh, spaces can you fit within that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a man door there, right. and there's an entrance. Right. So you have right. to have some buffer space between uh, a do between a, between doorways. You can't right. put bike racks right in front of doorways or anything. You know, too close. So all of that is reason why right now this is a, still a brainstorming and a fairly muddy uh, set of uh, of considerations. And I don't really have any anything to. To give you that's concrete, except to say, except at the bottom of the bike. The worst <laughs> case scenario is twenty-seven thousand dollars. Okay. And another minor question: I know we had um, approved the basketball hoops. Have the principals been involved in the placement of those and where they're going to go? They will be. Great. <laughs> we discussed it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, because that was. And they're going to put a. They're going to put together a written proposal okay. that is the product of. Their discussions with the staff members yeah, I, that are most see directly impacted kit, by yeah. all of this. Right, great. And again, we have time because the contractor has told us you've got time. Right. I do want to get the order placed though for the bike racks to make sure that they're that you know 
think I don't think we're dealing with a 12 week lead time on on bike racks. Right. We're mm -hmm. probably dealing with maybe six week lead time. So okay. we do need to have closure on all of this before uh, school lets out. So you'll have recommendations to us, David, in the next uh, meeting. Probably the next committee, the whole meeting. Okay. Not at the ap April meeting. Probably a month away. Okay. From getting. And we, 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 we do want to let the wellness committee, uh, you know, review the whole package, you know, have everybody that's been a, a, a concerned party to this whole discussion have some time to look at what's being put on the table for the board. Mm -hmm. In any case, I think the, uh, you know, the 25% increase in bicycle parking slots, I, 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 I hope that the board is comfortable with that recommendation. Mm -hmm and expanding the replacement of bike racks to Central, as well as Hauser, it's a good time to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, possible salad bar. Uh, we did a, uh, a survey of uh, school districts. Um, I, asked, uh, I asked for an update, and but, but that's just today. For us to get those remaining four that have not responded. Uh, two of the 20 have salad bars for elementary and junior high. One has for junior high only. One has a setup described as a farmer's market bar. And I've, just, I've had multiple conversations with Judy Steinke. Um, she's, you know, she's concerned about, a, you know, a few things. Wants to make sure that this is something that we, um, you know, are going to make a commitment to if, if, if we do that it'll be uh, sustainable operationally. Um, uh, first of all, she's she's given assurance that uh, our current dietary, uh, you know, the sti standards for meeting uh, dietary needs of students are being met. Uh, so this would be an augmenting or an enhancement rather right. than something that is really I'm not sure those essential. standards are incredibly rigorous, in my opinion. <laughs> I Pardon? think we could do better. I'm not sure the standards are, you know, in cream of the crop. I'm just saying I think we could do a lot better. But, And I don't, my daughter doesn't eat every day, but I think I'm just throwing that out there. I think we deserve special consideration for health and so. Well, the last I've heard from Judy is that she would like to pilot um, a kind of a salad bar uh, using a sneeze guard and a setup that would be not a large investment in equipment or space. Just, just to see what. Sneeze guard will do it for you. You hit me at salad bar, oh. you lost me at sneeze guard. Well, the, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know, there are practical problems with that when you think about the height of Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So I know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And, and <laughs> I won't be eating at the salad bar. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're raising the bar in terms of trust when you allow a student to do self-serve. And, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why um, this is not all that prevalent of an approach. I think it's worth piloting. Um, and and uh, But I think we, we better you know, be be careful not to have our hopes uh, elevated to the point where this is a you know for sure success story. Um, you know, the uh, one piece of chewing gum in a salad. Uh, yeah, we're done. The whole thing has to be thrown in the garbage immediately. Uh, do, you know. Do we serve salads now? Do they prepackage them, or do we serve salads at all now? Yes. So they're pretty we do package. we do serve fruits and vegetables and and, and, and side, salad. Sa side salad yeah Sorry. side salad so <laughs> I I'm gonna throw out Let my my dreamer um, ideal which I'm not sure facility wise we can do but I have read about schools that do amazing things where children help grow the food they're part of the process they wash and prepare the food and it's not an, a crazy idea um, they're doing that now and I don't think I don't think our kids are beyond that. I think they can handle it. I think they're responsible from what we've heard. So I just don't want to limit us thinking, oh, someone might might do something. I think we can expect great things. 
if we do it the right way. So I'm just saying, don't make it impossible. In my opinion, I think we can, if we have good plans and ideas, it can happen. We have a farmer's market right across the street from some of our schools. Can we tap some of those resources? The Maybe seasonally, you know, it doesn't have to be every day. Yeah, I was going to say the problem is the climate. Right. Well, then make us. it, you know, our farmer's market starts. It's a couple of months out of the school year, but it's a good place to start. I, just, I think leadership is going to be definitely needed. And, right. and I, you know, I don't know how well we're staffed with, you know, saying to Judy, this is now your I know. Your baby, I get what you've got saying. to run with it. I get it. At my former employer, we had uh, transition program students transitioning from being 18 years old to 21 years old, mm -hmm. and their uh, farmers market was a grand success. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. the school district mm -hmm. invested in right. a full blown, uh, basically a little farm right. on a plot Yeah, and of I'm land. not talking about high schoolers. I'm actually right. when I'm speaking, I'm talking about younger ones. You need to actually start younger if you want them to have an appreciation for what they're eating and where it comes from. I just think we have so many amazing people in the community. Can we can we use those people um, and volunteers uh, to do what we want to do? You know? Randy is a landscape Randy guy. is a landscape right. architect. He's a gardener. Right He's, he grows food. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I yes. think that's a great idea. The question I have is we really it's, don't it's, have much land for that. I know. I, that's, that's what I'm saying. This is my dream. My dream. But um, not my dream, but I think it's definitely those possible. baseball fields behind Hauser. <laughs> That's the only thing. Yeah. We have to go. You don't need outdoor VE. No, we, we have to go water. vertical farming. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> like so greenhouse. No, and I'm not saying we need to grow yeah. everything right away. I'm just saying yeah, it's not impossible to have children be productive, responsible people. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, but I think so our landlocked situation really. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. We have the farmers market. Why can't we use them across the road? No. I get it. I get it. Yeah. There's always something, but work important things take planning and time, and you it's worth like it. You sound like you're volunteering. That's yes. what I thought. <laughs> you know, I get paid so much right now for the board. I got lots of time. So. Well, yeah. Judy is willing to to yeah. to do what she considers a workable pilot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of of increasing and creating a kind of a salad bar right. setting. Right. Her concern, I think, or concerns include student demand mm -hmm. our, our, our students you know their appetite is not probably what we would like it to be <laughs> as far as I know they, they want they want pizza and yeah, fries they yeah. want fries and pizza yeah. and burgers and the stuff that we would prefer that they kind of set aside and be more right. health conscious so I think what I'd like you know Judy to do is is develop uh, multiple scenario mm -hmm. uh, proposals mm -hmm. you know yeah. kind of an entry level pilot then if if assuming the pilot is success is successful what kind of equipment needs mm -hmm. would right. you foresee right. Right. we can for right. we can build those equipment needs into the fiscal 16-17 mm -hmm. uh, budget and say okay well we're gonna need this we're gonna need this we're gonna have to run some power we're gonna have to you know right. have all this set up and then and then um, the, with the board's uh, uh, blessing of that budget proposal, we, we would move forward and then uh, monitor the success of, the, of making this a new available option for kids. But keeping in mind that you know, we would only be the third of 20 school districts you know that are venturing into this territory. But okay. we could We're, be better than all of them. You know what? I, you know, I, I always expected great things to my students and I wouldn't expect less from us. I just don't want to limit us and I think we have so many. You can make it part of a science class where they grow hydroponic lettuce. It doesn't have to be an entire salad bar. I'm just saying you can think out of the box in a small way and you can grow it. It doesn't have to be giant farm, you know. David, just did giving examples. About, I'm sorry, did, did you be talk about any additional staff requirements? Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah. You probably have to have somebody there. To I, I would think that that you know. would stretch what right. she has down there a little bit I don't know well and that's that's my concern yeah. um, I mean I've, I've Judy is a fabulous person and she I don't want to oh, raise know. specters of kids reality. not being trustworthy but you know you, you do need to you need to watch what they're doing and be yeah. careful that that, that you know they're they're not doing anything that's mischievous isn't most when unsupervised isn't most yep. of the staff part-time to begin with yes mm -hmm. and then the other thing I recall when we had these um, discussions that involve the the food service staff um, wasn't one of their goals try to increase participation in sales I don't know how that's gone or if this pilot might tie into that 
remember, yeah, I think they're. To get more kids to participate in the program? Yeah. So I'm sort of like, has that been successful and would this help it be successful? But I think that there was a thing to increase sales. We increased prices on some items. Mm -hmm. There was some, we've had a presentation from a, an outsourced vendor that um, we didn't go with for one reason or other. Well, actually, I've asked, you know, this kind of falls into, I've asked Jeff to put that back on the agenda. Jeff wasn't uh, even aware of this, this, this vendor that the high school uses. And mm -hmm. so we, we're going to talk about it at the next meeting, and that may or may not impact the proposal at hand. So but I think that we need to talk about it all, and we can yeah. reserve the discussion until then. And the way it was structured was that it would actually be that's the that's the details that you know the problem was is that this vendor that came and we can get into it at the, at the meeting so that we can have a more boisterous discussion is that we we didn't understand the terms of it so we well, just wanted to talk about it as a, as a concept and, and whether that's something that uh, the board as a whole would be interested in at yeah, that the, meeting the way it was discussed it was going to be sort of an adjunct to RB we'd actually be in an intergovernmental agreement with RB right. but we wouldn't get the economies of scale we would have to make mm -hmm. it pay mm -hmm. on our kind of on our so it was mm -hmm. and again I'm not sure the vendor was the one who should have been presenting mm -hmm. an IGA but um, but the other thing is um, even in the short term basis maybe there's something they can do for Hollywood mm -hmm. you know uh, at least not a vendor but shared services mm -hmm. with um, RB for Hollywood because I guess oh what where do we provide hot lunches or, or only, only in Hauser and Central, Central, Central so there's three schools yeah, not so getting any been, service right. and that's part of the problem yeah right. so anyway they're like right. yeah different ideas so I'll put that on the agenda yeah. the new business for in the next meeting and then we can talk about if we want to uh, pursue it further all right yeah sounds okay. good Thanks. we we have joined a food purchasing co-op um, the uh, the co-op, uh, I, I can, I can, when when you uh, have your discussion of food services, I, I can forward the materials by, uh, related to this co-op. Um, it, it, you pay a, a, I think it's a seven hundred fifty dollar um, membership fee, and they're projecting that they should, that we should be able to cut our food uh, expenses by about fifteen thousand dollars. So it's a. And the list of schools that are involved with this co-op is is unbelievably uh, positive. Um, and where one of my former employers, Joliet Township High School, uh, recently switched from a co-op they had been using to this particular co-op. Mm -hmm. They do nationwide uh, something like three hundred billion dollars of, of cooperative purchasing. So their 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 power is 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 immense and we're so we're we're latching on to uh, a great resource for for reducing our costs because one of the things the board has looked at is, and was used as justification for raising the, the, the lunch price was you know being able to, to produce an income statement that's in the in the black instead of in mm -hmm. the red mm -hmm. so joining that co-op is going to help us be in, in the black um, I think you know one of the things that that you know I guess Judy could present to the board is, you know, what, 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 uh, what thought and uh, care uh, goes into the planning of all of the menus, and you know what are some of the pluses and minuses of that whole, uh, all those considerations that they face on a daily basis. Any other salad bar questions for David? <laughs> all right, moving right along. <laughs> And then uh, number four, uh, I'd like to forward a recommendation to the board for the April 9th regular meeting that uh, uh, Mr. Regan be uh, consulted when there is a need to have an administrative approval of an unforeseen construction. This is, this is where uh, a scenario, the general contractor is telling us that if, unless we give them direction in the immediate future, they're going to have to uh, hold off on project. progress right. that could impact negatively mm -hmm. the the end result of the project. So it's kind of an unforeseen construction conditions situation. Um, 
I've talked with Griff about this. I know that you know, Mr. Pat has had many, many years of experience with this type of thing. And um, so I, I think what's being presented as a recommendation is fairly customary. And um, uh, it, it would not include anything that's an enhancement to the project that would, you know, logically require the board's support. It's more of a of a necessity to react to a situation that threatens the uh, project staying on schedule, and yeah. we just recently encountered that with with uh, changing the electrical mm -hmm. requirements. Yeah, I, for the I elevator. like this proposal, and I like uh, bringing Rich in as the uh, finance and facilities chair, as getting his approval. I think that's a great idea. That way, the board is informed. The only question I have is on the fifteen thousand. It would seem like in, it, it, that seems like a sort of an arbitrary number in some ways. Um, is, is it would it make more sense to, in general, have like a percentage of the project? I mean, more expensive projects you would think are going to require more and less expensive, less. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's not, maybe that's enough. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Where, I just don't know where this number came from and if it's desirable to have a percentage number instead. But. I had the same question. How did you select that number, David? I lived for 11 years with a $20,000 understanding and it was workable um a percentage of the project um i'd be comfortable oh, whatever with that. I mean, maybe you and i could talk about it uh yeah and come up with a number that that you, you think makes sense the uh you know hopefully you're not seeing a whole lot of of uh, unforeseen construction right. change orders so you're not invoking this all that often um, I, I just spent 11 years where that was the standard $20,000, and I thought this this is a smaller uh, operation generally, not the, so big of uh, uh, magnitude, so 15 ought to do it. If the project is sufficiently researched and prepared for, you really shouldn't have many. I mean, it should right. be the rare and foreseen yeah. circumstance. It really it's a good benchmark be. of whether or not you're dealing with the right architect. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a lot of change orders, then <coughs> that's a bad mm -hmm. sign. That makes sense. I did have a couple questions, if I could, about the uh, elevator project in particular. Um, uh, one is, uh, we asked for some, some diagrams for the plan, and, and he, he gave us, the architect gave us um, some sort of top-down views of where it's going to go. But I haven't seen any, like, what it's going to look like. If you're standing in the hallway looking at the elevator, how deeply is going to be recessed, how, what's the, like, how is it going to blend in with what's around it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, does he have any plans like that, where he, he shows, like, if, what's going to look like if you're standing there? Mm -hmm. In front of the elevator, I mean, is that, is that what's the color of the elevator? All those those fine points. If you you know what's basically what's the whole thing going to look like when all is said and done? Well, the elevator has already been ordered. Okay. <laughs> so so I could. <laughs> well, that's the cab. I think I think Jeff is referring to the elevation of the, the finishes yeah. and how right. he's going to blend the exterior with, with, with what's what we existing. have there. We got brick in the hallway and all that. How is that going to all meld together? You know, from the aesthetic point of view. So does he have plans like that that we could look at, or is he? I'm sure he's got something. I mean, he must have. He gave us some over, some PDFs of overviews. I think there were two of them, and I don't remember seeing elevations in there. Well, the basically what he's provided is floor plans, mm -hmm. and um, I can get back to you regarding uh, what the finishes on the doors. You know, because I mean, basically the elevator is going to occupy space inside of rooms mm -hmm. and the exterior wall to the cavity in which the elevator is, is located will will just be uh, I made to be as identical as possible to the interior walls. Right. I'm, I'm more interested in, if, in looking at the elevator from the outside. So if you're in the standing in the hallway and you're looking at the elevator, you know, what's it, how are they going to make it all look like it's naturally there as opposed to they just slapped it in there and it's sort of the I framing guess, yeah the framing and stuff like that yeah, yeah. okay well I, th I think the goal but I'll verify this with Paul Pacetti is to frame it out so that it's going to blend with mm -hmm. the hallway right. as as aesthetically as um, possible uh, you know non obtrusive as possible okay. but I'll talk to him about it two big him. bright yellow poppers <laughs> yeah <laughs> could, yeah could we ask that that made by students that's kind of cute actually actually the elevator is pink but David didn't want to talk <laughs> yeah right pink. Yeah. Pink. Yeah. Yeah. That was it was my favorite color kind of <laughs> I think, uh, <laughs> I I think he should just kind of post his full set of drawings so we could just put it in a board book and then yeah. anybody can look at it and that sounds good you know I know I've had requests from other community members to see what it's going to look like so I'd like to just be able to just direct them to that resource. 
I'm sure April would like to see. So my other questions about the elevator project were um, soundproofing. Is that, I mean, are, is there an issue with the sound of the elevator going up and down for the kids that are in the room that's going to be, where they're, they're taking a corner of the right. classroom out I, uh, for the elevator? Are they going to hear it going up and down, or is there, does it need soundproofing or anything like that? that I had asked that when they first yeah, talked to him, right. and he yeah. said that they would look at it, but I not. hadn't heard what okay. he had found. So we wouldn't want that, you know, so you're sitting in the class. Whoosh, whoosh, oh, I've worked next session. to an elevator, and it's loud. It's not It's not minimal. Yeah. It's a masonry shaft. Right. I'll, uh, I'll ask him about soundproofing of the shaft. And then my final question is, um, I get nervous about <coughs> projects that are custom in a way, like this, like the paving project seems like it's kind of generic. I mean, it's just a generic paving project. This is they're putting an elevator in a building that wasn't designed for that. I mean, they're kind of coming in retroactively. And in my experience, just working on my house, it's like there are always stuff that happens that this never goes as smoothly as you hope. And given that mm -hmm. this is already going to extend okay. into, this, into the school year, I just am very um, concerned that we, it, it, we, we make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible so that we're not like sitting around here in October and there's right. a big hole in the wall and you know it's, it's <laughs> prepare for it, that because then well, everything will be better yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like how do we the contractor has drawn up a schedule that's sort of like how do we make sure it's on, on track and like the that's contractor has drawn up a schedule that has this finished by August 19th okay well that that'd be great that's okay. a good sign already and 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 as a matter of fact today Paul Pacetti said that he can't remember the last time that he had fully approved shop drawings by this time. Okay. Okay. So right now, all shop drawings have been, and submittals have been forwarded to the architect and turned around. So this this project has already moved along uh, very well. Um, but I, you know, the fact that he's willing to put in writing that that he's shooting for an August 19th completion date. Is, is very positive right there. I think it would be good if we saw project timelines, right? And I know Paul prepared it, but maybe we, we see the monthly updates. Yeah, that would be, no, update. we haven't seen a good it. idea. Yeah. That way, right. Right. we can see if things are on track, basically. We can yeah. see if yeah. he's hitting his milestones for each phase of the project, for demolition, right. for prep, for fit out, all mm -hmm. that. Right. And we'll, we'll also work on contingency instructional plans just Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. because we'll do that, it'll be done. Okay. Because that'll take a lot of work on it. I've, 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 I've never been involved in a project <laughs> where the board is reviewing every single benchmark completion date. But but this this is a new experience for me. <laughs> just we just but he gave he today he gave us a list which yeah. I could share with the board of of uh, like 20 items, mm -hmm. start dates and stop dates on each one of the items. Great. We discussed when he was going to start the concrete. When he was going to complete the concrete, mm -hmm. when we're going to put up uh, uh, visqueen barriers mm -hmm. to various parts of the hallway, when those barriers can come down, um, when his electrician is going to be starting, mm -hmm. you know, so all those things are are a level of minutia that is definitely taking place, mm -hmm. yeah. and it, and will be covered in every weekly meeting mm -hmm. that is is okay. being that is taking place. Yeah. Every weekly meeting, and and board members are are, are welcome to sit in on, on any weekly meeting. We can uh, let you know when those week, weekly meetings are going to take place. I won't be here for every one of them, but I will be probably tapping in by telephone to just about every meeting. That's good to know, and we know that your schedule is going to have you away from the district for a good part of this, but you'll still keep your eye on it. We just know that there's going to be transition happening right. here, and we, you know, we want to mm -hmm. we want to be involved as much as as is well, helpful. Well, I can put a hard hat on. The, the <laughs> early indicators. I, I, have I thought you already had one there. I did a pop print. <laughs> no, I have one. Okay, so I'll put that down as as another item. The um, uh, the Gantt chart uh, activities list with start and stop dates. Uh, I'll share that with the board. Thank you very I much. I just have a minor question. I, when, um, Mr. Bassetti had originally told us we might be able to take out the chair lifts in the hallways with the addition of the elevator, but do we still think that's a good idea? Or are they, do we, should we keep them? Obviously, they have to stay during construction. I remember him talking about that because of the narrowing right. um, stairwells. Is there any talk of what will happen? I don't remember if I asked April that or not. That's a good question, Sherry. Well, because he had talked about that as a, a bonus of mm -hmm. why it's a good thing to do it. Because it'll save space and get people there are moving faster. You can, but there are places you have to leave them in because the 
the elevator. Yeah, sure, yeah, the, yeah, the mezzanine yeah. will yeah. remain unavailable right. except by... No, yeah. obviously right, during right. construction, I mean, after it's finished, are we going to keep... I think it was mice? depending on where the elevator was going to be located. Depending on where it is. Okay. You have some chairlifts that probably could disappear, but and other places they stay have to stay. Yeah, yeah. the mezzanine have to You can't take it. No, not there, but you had mentioned a few of them we could... Mr. Brockway asked for clarification of this for us to provide a count. Uh, we, there, were, there are 30 classrooms that will be accessible and benefited by the elevator. Okay. There will be five classrooms that okay. will not. And those classrooms are located on the mezzanine right, level. Right, obviously, yeah. No, I just and remember him those, saying that. Those, I was those motorized lifts right. for the mezzanine right. level will be the only lifts that will remain. Right. Any, any lifts anywhere else are, will not be needed. Okay. Is the removal part of the scope of work? The removal of those the chairs question. that are no longer needed? I'll have to check on it. It might be, check. is it a change Thank order? You. Uh oh. <laughs> we have a maintenance company that, that deals with those okay. lifts. So okay. if, if it isn't in the project, we would just have that company come by and pull them out. Okay. Great. Any other questions for David? No. I think there was a late agenda item. There was this was part of right? David's um, letter projection that he just gave you. Mm -hmm. He asked me to run potential financial implication for the K-5 math adoption should it come to a recommendation at the April board meeting we will be recommending one way or the other whether we have a recommendation for the adoption or whether we have a recommendation to continue searching for the right program it'll be one way or the other so I ran the numbers um, for the potential adoption so that you would see them because part of the opportunity is to get the teachers trained in June should we adopt we had 30 I think I said 38 out of the like 50 teachers that need to be trained available in June to do mm -hmm. the training and mm -hmm. the vendor available should we proceed um, which would mean we'd want to order the materials for them to have and to hold and mm -hmm. to get to know um, in June so we could expend it out of this year's budget given the surplus that he projected um, what his original expenditure report was indicating um, so I ran what the fiscal year implications would be for 2016 should we make the recommendation to adopt at the April board meeting and be able to explain that before our fiscal year 16 is over. Um, so that's what you have in front of you. You see the, the green number there, that's the pilot materials that we received at no charge. And then you see the rest of the materials cost. The PD for the June date um, requires two trainers because of the number of people we're training. And then, um, the PD that would be embedded into fiscal year 17. I put a note at the bottom. You'll get a more detailed explanation should we recommend the adoption, but it's two and a half days per grade level spread out over the course of the school year. Um, and that's required in order to adopt this program. Um, so those are the numbers and what they're looking like. And Mr. Sellers feels comfortable that we could push that through this year should we move forward with a recommendation. One, one real bright spot in our current fiscal year results is property tax refunds. You know, our exposure on refunds is, is, is large, but what's been accumulating year to date, um, you know, we're probably looking at, at you know, it, whereas last year was $750,000 across all funds, we're probably talking about less than less than five hundred thousand dollars for mm -hmm. all funds combined by the time we're done with it that's all you know fingers and toes crossed right. but, mm -hmm. but at, at this point mm -hmm. in time uh the budget is developing favorably and and i in talking over this with, with merrill um it seems like there's a timing issue right. as far as getting the implementation started mm -hmm. and the auditor is going to come along uh, we can't charge something to the subsequent fiscal year anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The auditor right. will say, well, if you expended the money, yeah. it's going to be charged to the right. current yeah. fiscal yeah. year. So, so we wouldn't want to, you know, we would have to delay it after July 1 mm -hmm. for implementation. It seems like getting it done earlier than July 1 is, is desirable. Right. So you feel like we have a strong enough sense of what those potential property tax refunds are going to be like to make a commitment for that money? By April 19th. Well, it's, well, you, it's not. I, a, it's not only that. The commitment. Then you'll be getting the recommendation, and then um, you would. It would go on the consent agenda for May. For the May meeting. Yeah, but with the authorization to maybe execute the POs once the money comes in. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Griff was okay. hoping to to propose it that way. Should the recommendation come forward? So, 
recommendation is to pay for this with property tax? Is that what no, I'm No, no, no. no all, I, all I'm saying is that But no. you'll have more time you, to know. You've, you've right. got a few categories. I was just saying I'd like to underscore that that's one thing that's coming in favorably. Okay. Another thing that's coming in favorably is uh, is benefits as compared to the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, there's two reasons why you can be favorable in terms of a budget variance. Mm -hmm. Number one, costs have really dropped and you've, you've gotten a better <laughs> economic climate for the uh, the particular cost category mm -hmm. another cause could be that the that the person who developed the budget did a bad job and and oh, overestimated God. the expenditures <laughs> unrealistically so um, I think we had a little bit of a high estimate on the on on benefits okay. which which is good we need to be cautious when I when I do a budget development process mm -hmm. um, but benefits is looking good and just some other Miscellaneous categories. When you combine everything, we're we're four hundred thirty-eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars more uh, favorable mm -hmm. uh, with all these categories combined, mm -hmm. and and you're talking about a one hundred and eighty thousand dollar commitment that is relatively time sensitive. So I, I think it's advisable to move ahead. Okay. So you'll get the full um, long presentation once the committee makes its final recommendation. Very good. good. Any other questions? Great. So we, um, we have future meeting dates on April 19th, the regular business meeting at 6.30 uh, with the closed session. The open session will be at 7 p.m. That's at Hauser. Um, this next meeting will be a, a special meeting of the board April 26th. That will be with our new uh, superintendent-elect uh, for training. <laughs> May 3rd is a committee of the whole at 7 p.m. here in Hauser. And then May 17th will be a regular business meeting that will uh, be in the multi-purpose room of Ames. Yeah. So is there any other business? No, there's, if there's no other business, then the meeting is adjourned.